So we're pleased to welcome for uh, this first talk of today, uh, Anthony Anachev, which is, will be giving the second lecture about the uh, algebraic theory of community for meromorphic functions on a complex analytic variety. Thank you. Uh, so let me recall uh, where I ended last time. Uh, so I want to put on the board this equivalence between integral closure of ideals and uh, analytic inequalities. Uh, this is the main, uh, of the, well, it's the underlying principle that uh, allows us to translate uh, Lipschitz or more generally Hilder inequalities into uh, algebra. So, so we have the setup here is that X is reduced, a complex analytic variety, and I is an ideal in, uh, the, so we work at a point locally and I is an ideal in the local ring of functions. Uh, so then an element F belongs to the integral closure of the ideal, Okay, so that's what it means. So here the AIs belong to the various powers of the ideal I. And so one, well, the statement is, is that one and two are equivalent and two is that uh, if uh, J1 to JK are a set of generators uh, for the ideal I, then there exists, ah, and uh, sorry, and U is a small enough neighborhood, and U is small enough neighborhood then there exists a constant C depending on uh, on F and U such that F of X is bounded by the constant times the supremum of uh, uh, GI of X, where X runs uh, in, uh, in uh, this neighborhood U, okay? So this is all classic. And last time I introduced the notion of powers of ideals. So let me, uh, rational powers of ideals. So let me re recall this, rational powers of ideals. So if we have a commutative ring R, well, let's assume it's Newtonian and an ideal I, we def and alpha is a fraction P divided by Q, then I sub alpha, so this is a rational number, is defined as all elements in the ring R, such that X to the Q, X to the power Q belongs to the integral closure of the P power. We cannot see this part. So I sub alpha, is equal to, well, it's all these elements in the ring such that x to the q is equal to the integral closure pi to the p. Uh, it belongs to the integral closure, the p power of i. Okay. So, so we have, we want to study the Hilder inequality. <laughs> so let me um, erase this. So we want to study so for a metamorphic function mf from from uh, over, over x we want to study uh, this inequality uh, in fact 
um, will restrict uh, yeah, so in fact, I can um, um, so yeah, of course, we can rewrite this inequality. I can raise to the power q here. I mean, these are all non-negative uh, real numbers. Um, so now the question is, so if we want to characterize these functions that satisfy such an equality, uh, how do we turn this uh, problem uh, uh, as a problem of algebra? How do we translate algebraically this inequality for these meromorphic functions or the meromorphic functions over X into, uh, into algebra? So we need to introduce the right ideal to do this. So you see that here we have X and Y. Um, so we have, um, so this takes uh, obviously place over uh, X cross X. Uh, so we need to introduce, um, uh, well, the, the right ideal. So here is a construction that goes back to uh, this year and fun. So this is so it, it can be uh, seen in their uh, paper, um, which is uh, also translated into English recently, as I remarked yesterday. So the idea also you look at, uh, and you look at, so you see like we're going to look at uh, locally bounded functions to begin with. Um, this is clear and all these locally bounded functions as we, um, all locally bounded meromorphic functions as we discovered yesterday are precisely uh, the functions uh, from the integral closure of O of X. Okay, so this is uh, the right object to look at. So this is by bar with you know the normalization, and I'm going to uh, you know by delta uh, the diagonal. So the ideal is is ideal that is the kernel. Of, I mean of this map. So again, we can assume that we work locally at a point, or maybe even maybe let's assume that we are at zero. That's simple. I will I will be more explicit uh, in a second. So the last time I introduced this uh, Hyoder saturation for exponent p divided by q. So these are all uh, well. I guess I need to I need to yeah. So these are all these are all. Um, Functions from metamorphic functions from the integral closure satisfying this thing f tensor one minus one tensor f uh, is in this rational power of the ideal i of them. Okay, so it's uh, you see this inequality translates exactly. So I mean I can raise this to the power of q here. So then by the length Tessier 
I'm sorry, by the Tessier and Gelabert's result. Tony, Tony yeah. can, can you put the board a little lower, please? Lower, yes. Yes. Is that okay? A little bit more. A bit more. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so, so this inequality uh, by the, the result that I just erased, er, erased, translates, um, translates into, um, uh, 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 translates into uh, uh, this condition that uh, f tensor one minus one tensor f belongs to uh, this rational power of i. Okay, so that the q power of this belongs to the integral closure of the ideal generated by uh, the various coordinates x i minus y i. So this is, uh, yeah, this is the description of uh, this Kilder saturation here. Uh, so it's not so clear that this, uh, this set, to begin with, it, it's just a set that it forms a coherent module. Um, so this is a simple result. So one needs just to see that this form, it's a module. So you see this set is containing the integral closure. So the set, this O x uh, zero p divided by q is contained in the integral closure. So we have this chain. So this, the integral closure here, there is a bar, I don't know if you see it. Uh, the integral closure is a finite O x module. Excuse me, Tony, please put the board a little lower again, because we cannot it, see. Okay, it, thank you. Oh, does it move when I write? Ah, okay, okay. So I'll have to please remind me. Okay. So, so all, all one needs to do is to check that this is a it, it's an it's an OX module, and that will immediately force this to be uh, finally generated OX module. Uh, I mean, it, it's a trivial verification. Oh, I wouldn't, so it's an observation. So let's put it as an observation. Uh, OXPQ is a finitely generated OX module. Uh, well, proof. So what do we have to do? So we have to check that if F and G are in OX 0PQ, but then f plus g is there. But this is um, this is really it's clear from. Uh, I mean, you can you can do it in various ways, but uh, you can also use the fact that <laughs> the rational power of an idea is an idea. <laughs> so uh, and then, of course, you have to do this r times f. Uh, uh, well, R is uh, in O of X and F is in O X P Q. You want to see that this is there. Uh, well, this is uh, this is uh, clear. This is also um, here. I mean, this is uh, R is a uh, belongs to this idea as a, as a holomorphic function. So again, you can use the property of, of ideas. Uh, if you want, in fact, you can see that this is, uh, just forget about what I did, but also you can see that this is, uh, that this is an algebra. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you want to convince yourself that this is an algebra, of course, the, 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 the hardest point, the hardest part is to take two elements in uh, uh, OXPQ and multiply them and see that they are, they land in OXPQ. Um, so this is a uh, sixth grade exercise to do. 
So you can, uh, so if uh, R and F are in OXP, Q, you want to see that R times F is in OXP Q. Uh, so what you want to check is uh, that R, uh, you want to check that R X F of uh, X minus R of Y, F of Y is seen to be ideal. The, 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 this rational power of I, I mean, you just add uh, Rx Fy and subtract Rx Fy. Yeah, grouping. So, okay, I will pull down later. So, R of X, F of X minus F of Y plus F of Y, R of X minus R of Y. Okay, so these are, uh, these belong to the ideal. So the product, the product of R with F also, uh, R of X minus F of X, uh, R of X times F of X minus R of Y, F of Y belongs to this idea. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, now why do we care about this? So here is a, illustration oh, which gives me to the application of this uh, theory. So we'll be interested in the case P equals Q equals, yeah, equals Q equals one. Okay, so now I am in this case. And so this is, these are all, so then O of one, one, this is the Lipschitz saturation. And so this, uh, this is precisely all meromorphic functions, consists of all meromorphic functions that are Lipschitz continuous. Okay, so now I want to describe how uh, one applies the Lipschitz saturation uh, to the study of quasi-ordinary singularities um, and quasi-ordinary singularities appear very naturally in uh, the risky equi singularity. Uh, I don't have time to discuss this connection right now, but more, yeah, my goal is to give you um, uh, an idea of how to uh, use this algebraic descript description of the Lipschitz continuous functions in order to prove a result about quasi-ordinary singularities. Okay, so this is the second topic. We're done with algebra, so quasi-ordinary singularities. So what is a quasi-ordinary singularity? Let me give a definition. So I'm looking at an irreducible hypersurface. Okay, so we say that this is quasi is quasi ordinary, or I will abbreviate this by QO. If there exists a finite map, I from X to CD. So the dimension of X is D. So we project to affine space of the same dimension. So if there exists such a finite map, such that the discriminant of this uh, yeah, projection is, uh, um, is contained 
in a normal crossing divisor, NCD. So I will skip various technical details here, but the existence of such a such a projection already tells us a lot about X. So this is a very strong assumption. We have some nice parameterization of X. This is what this projection gives. So let me recall, this is all classical, what this parameterization is. So it, um, So after change of coordinates, so this projection, we can assume that this projection is induced from coordinate from a projection like this. We just project on the first view uh, coordinates. So by the Weierstrass preparation theorem, then I can write this uh, f. So f is. Well, x is given as the zero locus of f. Okay, so I can write f in this way. Okay, so the FIs are non unit convergent power series. Okay, and uh, so because this uh, discriminant is contained in a normal crossing divisor, so by the Riemann extension theorem and the fact that the fundamental group of the complement. Uh, of the discriminant is uh, free abelian, uh, we can, we can uh, uh, um, we can derive that the roots, so we have a result about the roots of that, our power series in this ring. So this is the Bianker Jung result. And because X is quasi ordinary, uh, then the discriminant, uh, it's, a, it's a product of, it's a monomial. It's a monomial. So this uh, epsilon here is a unit. And uh, now what we get is that zeta i minus zeta j by the zeta, so zeta i, I'll denote the roots of f. So zeta i minus zeta, zeta j divides this discriminant. So what we derive is that these zetas are monomials, and they're very specific monomials. They're called the characteristic monomials. So these Mij, these are called characteristic monomials. Well, this times some units. I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, what if I are not units? Just the last one or uh, all of them? <sighs> Maybe it's just the last one. That's uh, let's see. I mean, you just want that uh, is a singularity of zero. I mean, that it, f of zero. F, yeah, f of zero yeah. is zero, so you want this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. The last one, f, f, f sub n. Yeah, which is a model. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, and the exponents of these monomials m i j are called the characteristic. Uh, Exponents. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll denote them by a lambda one, so lambda j, and I'll underline them uh, to uh, uh, emphasize that these are, in fact, yeah, these are vectors. These are uh, vectors of length b. With, yeah. So, so for, for curves, here is here I have to point out that for curves, these are precisely the characteristic exponents that um, appear in the Newton Pizot uh, series. So the result that I want to discuss today is a, it's a joint uh, part of a joint uh, paper in progress with uh, Hussein uh, Bernard. Tony, yeah. excuse me, I missed something. Uh, yeah. Your lambda one, lambda g are uh, the characteristic monomials. That's right. That's right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and also, you need all the FIs to vanish at the origin. Otherwise, you can replace F by a polynomial mm -hmm. with a smaller degree. Mm -hmm. The very fast preparation theorem. Uh -huh. Aha! Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, so then I was what I wrote was uh, the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. No, you're right. So the FR is vanish. Otherwise, you can uh, you can lower the you degree. can lower the degree exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Okay. So, so the result that we're after is the following. So, if we have two. Uh, germs of quasi-ordinary singularities, we say that they're by Lipschitz equivalent. So here everything is with respect to the outer metric. Um, if and only if x and x prime have the same characteristic exponents, So now in the remaining uh, uh, 12 minutes, I would like to um, uh, give the, the structure of the proof, the main idea. Um, and the main, the main ingredient, technical ingredient is the Lipschitz saturation. But in fact, that we can put our hands on the Lipschitz saturation uh, based on this algebraic description that I gave of the Lipschitz saturation. This is, uh, this is the main idea. So let's... Uh, let's discuss this. So what is the first step? Well, the first step is uh, to check the forward direction of the statement. So if these are by Lipschitz, then they're topologically equisingular. And then we use results of Lippmann and Gao. So there's it's a black box, this work of Lippmann and Gao that tells us that uh, uh, X and X prime have the same characteristic exponents. Okay, so this is literally an application of uh, the work of Lippmann and Gao, which is published in. Uh, and in a memoir of the AMS, it's a very long uh, memoir. Uh, but yeah, this direction is uh, given by the results. And so now, really, we're interested in the opposite direction. So if we have two quasi-ordinary singularities with the same characteristic exponents, can we prove that they are by Lipschitz? So, um, what is the idea? So here we have x. So here we have x prime. So you see, comparing x and x prime directly, it's not that easy. So what we can do is uh, the following. So the first observation is that they have the same normalizations. This is so classical. Uh, 
And so what one does is one looks at the saturation, Lipschitz saturation. I'll describe what this is. Okay, so we're going to uh, adjoin to the local ring of X all Lipschitz continuous functions and look at the projective, uh, uh, look at the uh, respective uh, uh, spectrum of that ring. This will give us the saturation. And the hope here is that, well, that these two saturations will turn out to be um, isomorphic. Now, if we prove this, seeing that X and X prime are by Lipschitz, it's almost for free. And the reason is that this is by Lipschitz. It's by definitions because the way, uh, the way, uh, uh, the Lipschitz saturation is uh, constructed. It's constructed by Lipschitz fun uh, metamorphic functions. So this immediately gives you a by Lipschitz homomorphism with respect to the outer metric. Okay, so, so now really the question is how to prove this. Okay, so what is it? Uh, what's the saturation? Let me write it here. So XS. Is spec, as I said, of OX, and a number of, maybe I should denote them by G, G1 to GQ, uh, the G I star, all Lipschitz metamorphic functions. These are the Lipschitz metamorphic. Okay, so, so how do we test that a function f from the integral closure is uh, Lipschitz? Well, if it's Lipschitz, it satisfies the following inequality. Mm -hmm. Zt times Z minus T. So Z and T are in now. Uh, X. Okay. And uh, I can also say that this is the same thing as Fz minus Ft. There's an equal than the C times the supremum of Zi minus Ti. So if these are, yeah, some, yeah, local, Coordinates or Fz minus Ft, Fz minus Ft belongs now using uh, the result of uh, Bernard and Monique. Uh, so it belongs to this ideal that I'll denote by i, to the integral closure of this ideal. Uh, it's the ideal generated, let me use vector notation by Z minus T. And uh, Zeta of Z minus Zeta of T. So here is something that uh, I need to point out. What, are, what is this Zeta? Zeta is, yeah, well, these are, I'm, I'm working uh, on the level of a branch. Okay, so Zeta gives a branch. Uh, so let's, uh, maybe let's be more explicit here. So assume that we work with surfaces. Okay, so X is a surface. A surface in uh, C3. So what I can do is I can consider a parametrization given by S1, S2 goes to 
S1 to the end, S2 to the end. And here I have some series data of S1, S2. So this is because, because X is uh, quasi ordinary, I have this parametrization. This data, it's a power series, and the characteristic monomials participate in this uh, power series. They govern the behavior of this power series. So this is very important. So now let's, let's say I want to uh, uh, compute uh, the Lipschitz saturation. So again, I'm on the level here. I want to see that these Lipschitz saturations are isomorphic. There is one easy case uh, when these saturations are in fact the same. So let me illustrate this case. And with this, I will end. So all characteristics of one easy case, one easy case is uh, when um, the, uh, the degrees of the characteristic monomials are greater or equal than n. I'll explain why. So how do we compute the saturation so it well So in this case, it turns out that this Lipschitz saturation, or let me, yeah, let me denote it like that, uh, saturation with S, uh, is, uh, well, it is generated by these characteristic monomials. So provided that these characteristic monomials are all of degree at least 10. And how do we see this? So let me just give you uh, uh, the idea. Um, so suppose, so it is generated by the characteristic monomials. So, so suppose you work with a characteristic monomial. So how do we, how do you prove that this characteristic monomial S1 to the power of A times S2 to the power of B is in the Lipschitz saturation. Well, what, by what I described, one has to check that this monomial minus, so we work on the, on the double, X cross X, uh, is in the integral closure of this idea. Okay, so this is the test. So you see the condition that we have here is that A plus B is at least 10. Okay, so how does one check this? Well, integral closure can be checked on curves. So what you do, you, this is the curve criterion. So you looked at a curve, like an arbitrary curve, in uh, X, not like this. And uh, well, you look at the, so the parameterization. So I, I, I will use a parameter U. And so you substitute, well, you say S1 is equal to U to the times alpha one times uh, a unit, S1 hat. S2 is equal to U to the alpha two, S2 hat. T1 is equal to U to the time beta one, T1 hat. T2 is equal to U to the beta two times T2 hat. 
And of course, there is a relation between these alphas uh, and uh, Ti's and Si's. Um, it's given by the equation of, uh, of X, okay? But what is the idea here? Well, now, in order to check that this is in the integral closure, one needs to check that the order of U, so this is U times U uh, to a certain power times a unit. So one needs to check that the order of U is less than the order of this ideal, okay? That's generated by the elements below the bar. And this is, in this case, this is not hard to see because like if, so A and B are higher than N, so very likely the first case to consider is that the order of this guy is greater or equal than the order of these guys here, of these generators. And the order here seems to be N, right? And this, the order here seems to be at least N, unless, this order here blows up. But if the order here blows up, this gives us a very precise, this gives us extra equations. So this is a very restrictive information. And now we're left with checking, with comparing the order of uh, these characteristic monomials with the order of this zeta minus zeta, zeta of s minus zeta of t. Well, here, it's, uh, the analysis is a bit more involved, but what you have to remember is that this difference of characteristic monomials appears here. And so if there are some cancellations with the previous characteristic monomials, that cancellation stops on this level, on, on the level when this characteristic monomial shows up here. So this is the kind of analysis that's involved in computing uh, the Lipschitz saturation, but in this case, once you prove that the Lipschitz saturation is generated by the characteristic monomials, well, X has, X and X prime have the same characteristic monomials, that's the theorem. So they have the same uh, Lipschitz saturations and by the scheme, by this scheme here, X and X prime, well, the saturations are the same, therefore X and X prime are by Lipschitz equivalent. So this is, this is the, the skeleton of the proof, and uh, this is where I am. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, yes, uh, I have a question, but not about this difficult part. I have a question about the first direction of the proof. Because uh, if I understand, uh, in your assumption, X and X prime are by Lipschitz equivalent, which means that there is a, an, uh, an homeomorphism, a by Lipschitz homeomorphism between them for the outer distance. But this homeomorphism is not an ambient homeomorphism. Right? And so I, I don't see how you can apply Lipman Gao, or maybe I'm, I misunderstood something, but. No, but in the current case, uh, maybe I can answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the current case, uh, we use the trick which is due to Banach, I think. Which, which is due to? Due to Banach, which is uh, if you have uh, uh, Lipschitz. Uh, function defined on a closed subset of uh, Rn or Cn in our case, then you can locally extend it to a Lipschitz function. Uh -huh. on the okay. It's a trick. You, a trick. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you look. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but uh, you look at the graph, and the Lipschitz condition tells you that the. Uh, that the graph is contained in some cone, and uh, you just uh, extend the cone geometrically, more or less, and uh, that, that gives you a, a new graph, which is uh, Lipschitz and coincides with the old one over the cross set. Okay. So, so, in fact, it's a property 
Uh, I, I don't know if it works for Hölder too. I, I guess it would, but for Lipschitz, it's pretty clear that it's, it works. Yes, but uh, for a higher dimension, I, 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 I'm not sure. Well, it has nothing to do with dimension. Uh -huh. it, it's just some Lipschitz function and some Euclidean space. Well, but you you can you can have uh, you can uh, you can find some hypersurfaces in C three, having um, having uh, uh, the same uh, 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 Lipschitz type outer Lipschitz type, but with different uh, w w w which are not uh, um, uh, uh, ambient ambient um, yes. Oh, yes, that's true. Lipschitz geometry does not determine the embedded topological type in general. Yeah, this is true in general, but well, let's well, maybe this needs to be answered later. But this is this is not from Lippmann and Gal. This is from Zariski uh, in his paper in uh, well, uh, these studies in equisangularity. Okay. He actually proves uh, this direction. So it's it's not from just from Lippis and Gao. We 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 yeah. are aware of uh, this uh, this example, this counter example you, you give, where you have that the uh, uh, that the uh, Lipschitz outer geometry does not determine the embedded topological type. Yes. So this is this is part of this is part of the uh, paper of uh, Zariski. It's, it's for uh, for uh, quasi ordinary singularities. Actually, in this paper, he introduces already these uh, characteristic exponents, which uh, which were much more maybe uh, much clearly uh, exposed in Lippmann's paper. But in this paper, also he introduced a kind of uh, Lipschitz saturation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is not the the same uh, the same notion of fan tessier saturation. And uh, uh, well, there this is uh, proved for quasi ordinary singularities. That, okay. that okay. Yes. Okay. So so this this needs to be at least exposed. I agree, but. Yeah, yeah, no, this is, uh, we use this uh, yeah. observation of Zelensky here. I also have to... Yeah. Okay, thank you. It, it answers the question. Okay, okay. Yes. You, you, you will give a precise reference in your paper, I imagine, to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is not really completely written. Okay. Absolutely. Give a, a precise reference. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, we can thank the speaker again. We welcome uh, Anne Pichon that uh, will give uh, the second lecture on the third lecture in uh, collaboration on the metric geometry of complex surfaces, Lipschitz normal embeddings, and polar exploration. And will be about the uh, Lipschitz normal embedding similarities. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, this uh, kind invitation. And uh, I apologize for the technical problems because I'm really, I'm not used uh, to these tools even after uh, more than one year. And um, for, I prefer Blackboard talks, of course, as anyone. But anyway, I will try to do my best. So. Uh, I will speak about uh, Lipschitz normal embeddings and uh, uh, probably um, uh, some of you already uh, listened to some of my talks about Lipschitz normal embeddings, but uh, the one I give uh, this morning is uh, 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 quite different because I will give an application of the uh, Laplacian formula on uh, the inner rate function uh, presented by uh, Lorenzo yesterday. So I will start uh, with uh, 
a complex surface uh, singularity with an isolated singularity, so a, a, a complex uh, germ. And uh, as uh, Lorenzo recalled uh, yesterday, um, if you take uh, the minimal good resolution of uh, X, um, and uh, if you consider its dual graph, then uh, this data is uh, equivalent to uh, the data of the topological type of X, which is uh, itself equivalent to the homeomorphism type of the link. And for example, uh, just to give two examples that I will uh, use again in the, in the sequel, you can consider E8, then this uh, dual graph is equivalent to the data of uh, its topological type. And also you can consider a more uh, sophisticated example, the Briançon spreader family. So it's parameterized by uh, C, a complex number. So if you fix T, you obtain an hypersurface in C3. And they all, for, for all T, they have the same topological type, which is uh, uh, this um, uh, dual graph. And here, the number eight corresponds to the genus of the corresponding uh, uh, component of the exceptional divisor. So now what I would like to uh, emphasize is the role of two families of curves already introduced by Lorenzo. The first one is uh, generic hyperplane sections, which will be um, in red uh, as uh, for Lorenzo yesterday. So you take a surface germ and you choose an embedding in some uh, CN. And then you, you choose a hyperplane, so a n minus one plane uh, in Cn, and you choose it um, generic, a generic choice in some sense. So you, you have a Zariski uh, open dense set in uh, your Grassmannian. You choose H and you intersect with your uh, surface. And what you get is uh, what we call a generic hyperplane section. And if you choose it uh, really generic, then the family of these curves uh, is equisingular. And in fact, uh, the, it's, uh, uh, it is resolved by the blow up of uh, the point, the blow up of the maximal ideal of X. And for example, if you take E8 again, then um, here you have at the extremity here you have the the, the vertex which corresponds to uh, the blow up of the maximal ideal and so to the curve x equals zero okay which is the equation of the projectivized tangent cone and uh, the hyperplane section consists of one single curve whose strict transform is uh, uh, symbolized by this red arrow Okay, and so uh, here uh, the minimal um, resolution of the surface uh, um, factorize through the blow up of the point. But in general, it is not the case. And in general, uh, the, the resolution of the family of uh, generic hyperplane section is absolutely not a topological data. For example, if you give, if you take the Briançon spreader family, so you start with this graph, which gives the topological type. And if you take T equals zero, you have to blow up twice to resolve the family of generic hyperplane section. And you get this uh, hyperplane section and this. Um, uh, on this uh, irreducible component. And the behavior is completely different if you take T uh, different from zero. In that case, the, a single hyperplane uh, 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 section is resolved uh, by the minimal resolution. And it is resolved like this, uh, on the, like on the left uh, diagram. But you have to blow up 
again twice to resolve the base point. Okay, and what you get is this graph. So this is the minimal resolution graph, which factorizes through the blow up of the point. And again, the red arrows are the strict transform of the generic hyperplane section. So it is absolutely not these two graphs, uh, a topological data. Now I pass to uh, another completely different kind of curves on my surface, polar curves. So um, what I take is I, I take again an embedding in some CN and I consider an N minus two uh, plane in CN D and I consider the generic, uh, the generic, uh, sorry, I, I, I consider the linear, uh, the linear um, form. So it doesn't go to C2, just to C with kernel D and I restrict it to the surface X. And I consider the polar curve of that, of that uh, projection, the critical uh, locus of uh, that uh, projection, okay? And if I take D uh, generic, so generic in uh, the, the Grassmannian of N minus two plane, again, I get an equisingular family which is resolved by the Nash transform of X. And uh, this operation is absolutely not, again, a topological one. For example, if you consider again E8, then uh, the polar one polar curve is resolved there. But if you want to really resolve the family, you have to blow up twice. And then you get this graph which is absolutely not uh, uh, given by the topological type, okay? And so now I will consider a triple already maybe introduced by uh, Lorenzo yesterday. I start with a surface germ and I consider the minimal good resolution which factors through the blow up of the point and through the Nash transform, okay? And then I consider, so gamma pi, it's dual graph. And now I consider the two sets of red and blue arrows. In other words, I consider the vector LP of uh, numbers LV and the vector uh, P, uh, pi uh, of numbers PV. PV is the number of uh, red arrows on blue arrows on the vertex V of the graph. In other words, it corresponds to the intersection of the corresponding irreducible curve of the exceptional divisor with respectively the hyperplane section and the polar strict transform, okay? So I consider uh, this uh, triple. And for example, for E8, it exactly corresponds to the data of this graph. Okay, and by the way, I will emphasize the role of two important uh, vertices of this uh, graph. I will call P node a vertex carrying blue arrows and L node, L for linear, a, a vertex carrying hyperplane section arrows. Okay, and the question I want to, to ask is, can we find special classes of surface of, of surfaces X for which this triple is determined by the topological type. And uh, I would like to state uh, several results about this. The first one is uh, Sp Spivakovsky's result and Bondil results. So Spivakovsky 1990 wrote uh, a paper giving uh, an algorithm to resolve normal surfaces as uh, by a, a finite sequence of normalized Nash transform, Nash blow up. And um, um, in, the, in his paper, uh, he, he studied a special case, the, the case of minimal surface singularity. And in order to, to prove uh, the, that the algorithm works, 
uh, he had to prove that, uh, so given a minimal surface singularity, the topological type of this uh, singularity determines uh, first, determines the triple uh, gamma pi, L pi, and P pi, okay? And later, independently, Romain Bondil proved that in fact, this topological type also uh, determines the topological type of the discriminant curve of uh, a generic projection, okay? So this answers uh, positively uh, the, the question. And uh, much later, uh, we prove with uh, uh, Fantini and uh, André Bellotto the following theorem. If you take a normal surface singularity, which is Lipschitz normally embedded, then the topological type determines the same data as before. So the, the triple and the topological type of the discriminant curve plus the inner rate function on the dual graph gamma pi introduced by uh, Lorenzo yesterday. And actually, this uh, second theorem is nothing but a generalization of the first theorem of, of uh, Spivakovsky's and Bondil theorem, because uh, 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 minimal surface singularities are in fact uh, Lipschitz normally embedded. Uh, before uh, uh, before uh, uh, going to a, um, a better statement, more precise statement of theorem two, I will first uh, reintroduce uh, 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 Lipschitz normal embedding. So I remind uh, some facts about Lipschitz geometry. So you take uh, a complex analytic germ in CN, and so you have the outer distance and the inner distance as uh, defined by Lorenzo yesterday. And we will work in the Lipschitz category where objects are the complex germs and where the morphism are the local by Lipschitz homeomorphism between germs. And uh, there is a proposition, not difficult to prove actually, which uh, tells you that the by Lipschitz types of X for inner and outer metrics are independent of the choice of the embedding uh, X in uh, Rn. So I, I wrote Rn. In fact, it's Cn in my context, but it could be uh, in Rn, of course. And then the interest is that you have a hierarchy between classification. You have, uh, of course, the analytic classification. which by the proposition determines uh, the outer geometry, outer Lipschitz geometry, which itself determines the inner Lipschitz geometry, and itself it determines, of course, the topological type. And being Lipschitz normally embedded means that these two geometries, these two classes coincide, or more precisely, let me define more precisely what it means. It was introduced by uh, Birbrer and uh, Mostovsky in uh, 2000. We say that X is Lipschitz normally embedded if inner and outer metric on X are uh, by Lipschitz uh, equivalent, or in other words, if the identity is a, a by Lipschitz homeomorphism between outer and inner distance, so that you, so that you have a, such an inequality. And of course, the outer distance is always less or equal to the inner distance. Okay, so you have the double inequality, which tells you that the identity is a. Um, Lipschitz homeomorphism. Uh, to give uh, some examples, uh, of course, a smooth germ is Lipschitz normally embedded. And an anti example, consider the cusp, the real cusp, which is the most uh, 
easy to see. Consider the real cusp uh, y square equals uh, x3. And uh, so here you have x and here you have y, OK? And it is not Lipschitz normally embedded. In order to see this, consider the intersection of your cusp with the line x equal t. And then you get two arcs. You get one arc uh, delta 1t there, OK? And another arc delta 2t there. Okay, and now if you want to, if you if you compute the outer distance between both, it is simply the length of this uh, segment. So it is equivalent up to a constant to t power three over two, while the inner distance between delta one t and delta two t is obtained by taking uh, the 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 path from delta one t to delta two t inside the cusp, so you have to pass through the origin, and it has length equivalent to t, and this proves that the cusp is not Lipschitz normally embedded, because uh, if you take the limit as t goes to zero between the outer and the inner distance then it, uh, it tends, the limit is equal to zero, simply because the two rates that you obtain there, three over two and one are different, okay? And so this, it is an obvious remark. If you want to prove that, that a germ is not Lipschitz normally embedded, then you have to find, simply to find two such arcs for which uh, inner uh, um, contact and outer contact are different, okay? Now you can do the same for complex curve. Proposition, a complex curve germ is Lipschitz normally embedded if and only if it is a union of transversal smooth curve. And the proof is very simple. So for uh, simplicity, I will, I will assume that my curve is reduced. Okay, and I will do it simply on uh, the um, plane curve, uh, which is which has Puiseux parametrization y equals three over two. Imagine that c is not smooth, then it has a characteristic Puiseux exponent, for ex for example, three over two. Okay, and then um, so you consider your complex curve. So it is the same picture as before, but now it is a complex curve. And you consider, uh, you consider a, a projection of your complex curve on a complex line. And inside you comp your complex line that I will draw here, now you can consider a real radial line, okay? And you can parameterize half the line by distance to the origin. You, you get an arc delta, which is, uh, for example, uh, this one, okay? So inside C, you have an arc and you lift it. What you obtain is two arcs inside your curve, okay? And now you want to compute inner and outer distance again. The outer distance, it is very easy. It is again t three over two. And now what about the inner distance? I claim that the, the distance between the inner distance between these two points again is of order t power one, because you again you have to pass through the origin to get the minimal distance. And the reason is that your link. Okay, when you intersect your curve with an S3, your link behaves like uh, a, a braid for which uh, a braid, which is uh, something uh, of this type, flat, okay, you, you obtain it by turning these two points uh, around that circle, okay, over that circle. 
And then in order to go from this point to this point, either you have to follow the braid or you have to pass through the origin. And in both cases, you get a length which is of order t power one, okay? And so it's very simple for complex curve to get the list of the complex curve germs, which are Lipschitz normally embedded. Now, next step, we want to go to the surface case. So what happens with the surface case? Naively, we can try to do the same. So we take a surface, so a complex surface, okay, x, And let's try to do the same. I take a generic projection, L, from my, my surface to a C2, okay? So the same dimension. Generic means in particular, that means that uh, it belongs to uh, my former uh, 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 Zariski uh, dense open subsets, uh, subset for the, the kernel of the, the projection. Okay, and let's let's try to do the same. So I I do I I want to take uh, an arc downstairs and lift it. Okay, and then I take several points, several lifting like this. Okay, and several vertically aligned points. Again, the outer distance is no problem. I, I just uh, compute the, the, the length of this segment. But now, if I want to compute the inner distance between the two points, I have a problem because my projection have a curve very special, which is the polar curve, which does not exist for a complex, um, for a complex curve. And then in order to go from this point to this one, uh, maybe the shortest length is the one passing through the polar curve. So that's why studying Lipschitz normal and bidding for uh, higher dimensional um, uh, uh, complex uh, um, spaces, starting with surfaces is much more complicated than for a curve, okay? But I have a way to do that. Consider the Gauss map of the surface, which sends a non-singular point to its uh, tangent space. Okay, then it, it is a so-called Gauss map. And now consider the Nash transform of X, which consists of taking the, uh, uh, the, the pairs X tangent cone, uh, tangent space, sorry, and you take the closure inside X time, the Grassmannian of two planes in CN. What, uh, uh, um, what you do now is that you take uh, the projection, the first projection from NX to uh, the surface, and then you can now consider the second projection to the Grassmannian, and what you get is a well-defined Gauss map from this Nash transform to this Grassmannian, okay? And what happens is that uh, outside the polar curve, or rather outside the, outside the strict transform of the polar curve, this Gauss, enfin, everywhere the Gauss map is well defined, and uh, uh, outside uh, a neighborhood of the polar curve, um, how to say that? Sorry. Um, uh, the, the tangent plane you get uh, outside is not inside the kernel of your projection, which means that locally L will be uh, locally. Uh, by Lipschitz map. The result is that you will be able to compute inner distance from this point to this other point simply by, uh, by um, measuring the distance between their uh, projection and 
the discriminant curve, you know, to be able to compute the distance uh, between them on the surface. Okay. And so to, to, to I, I won't go further in that direction, but Elena or uh, more generally Lipschitz uh, geometry of complex surface is a play between um, polar curve, discriminant curve, and generic projection of a surface. Okay. And now I would like to give a precise statement, a first uh, precise statement of the theorem I stated before, part one of the theorem. So you give yourself a, a Lipschitz normal embedding normal uh, surface, and you consider the minimal good resolution of X. So simply, uh, the, the graph, the dual graph will, will uh, give you the topological type of X. Then the resolution, the minimal resolution factors through the blow up of the point. And uh, moreover, the L nodes, so the node which carries, um, which carry um, strict transform of the hyperplane section have multiplicity M equals one. How to prove that? I go back uh, to the previous uh, slide. How to prove that? You give yourself a generic line there, and then the inverse image will be, will be a generic hyperplane section, okay? L minus uh, one of this line, L, will be, uh, simply, uh, when you intersect X, it, it is a generic hyperplane section, okay? And now you can do exactly the same story as we did for uh, a complex curve before. The inner distance between sheets will be of order one. And this means that the outer distance on the LNE surface has also to be of order uh, 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 t power one, okay? And it tells you that the hyperplane section is itself LNE, so it consists of smooth transversal curves. And uh, if you have a smooth curve on a surface, it means that it, its multiplicity is one. And uh, the fact that this uh, hyperplane section consists of smooth transversal curves tells you that uh, the, the tangent cone of the surface is reduced. And then it is fairly easy to obtain the first part of the theorem with this. The second part of the theorem tells you that the maximal ideal divisor on X, what it is, the maximal ideal divisor, you take H, um, a generic linear form on your surface, and you write its total transform sum of MV EV, so V are the vertices of the dual graph, plus the strict transform. Okay, and this is Z max. This is the maximum maximum ideal, okay? And uh, so this maximal ideal, of course, is not a, a topological data, but in the case of an LNE uh, surface germ, it coincides with the fundamental cycle Z min of gamma P, which is determined from gamma pi using Laufer's algorithm. What is Z min? That mean is the, the, the divisor MV EV um, such that for each W uh, sum of MV EV um, EW is a greater, sorry, is um, less or equal to zero. 
And there is an algorithm to determine the minimal of such cycle. And this, uh, this is called Zimin. Of course, uh, Zimin is included in the set of uh, Zimax, sorry, is, is, uh, uh, it belongs to Zimin, but it is not uh, necessarily, uh, sorry, um, uh, Zimax belongs to the set of uh, divisor uh, holding this inequality, but in general, it is not the minimal one, Zimin, except in the case of an LNE uh, normal surface. From uh, once you have Zmax, then you can determine the strict transform of the generic uh, um, uh, linear form, and so you can uh, determine the L vector, uh, L pi of x zero. And uh, once you have, um, uh, so you have uh, M v, you have the L vector. And also now you can also you can also uh, uh, you you know also the distance on gamma pi. I, I remind that the distance on gamma pi it was defined by Lorenzo. The fact that by the fact that the distance between the the length sorry I'm not very clear sorry the length of uh, an edge is one over the low common multiple between MV and MV prime. It was uh, in the course of Lorenzo yesterday. So you know all this data. And moreover, uh, you can determine the inner rate function uh, on gamma prime from this data. Simply, the inner rate on V will be uh, the distance between the vertex V and the set of uh, L node on your graph. The L node are, uh, of course, given by the, the second data. And so this is fairly easy, but it is not uh, quite what we want because now we want to know the so it gives you the two first items of your triple. It gives you gamma pi and L pi. And now what you want is P pi. And for this, we will use the Laplacian formula. What is the Laplacian formula? So I, I give here a, um, a quantitative uh, formulation of it. Uh, so consider a surface uh, germ with isolated singularity and pi, the, a good resolution which factors through the, the blow up of the point and uh, consider the inner rate function as, as defined by Lorenzo yesterday. You take, uh, you take uh, a curve inside the exceptional divisor of pi, and you take two curvettes, gamma one and gamma two, uh, on uh, uh, along uh, EV, and QV is the inner rate between gamma one and gamma two on the surface, okay? And, um, and so MV will be the multiplicity of the maximal ideal along EV. Uh, and no, so now what you have is the following. Consider the vector, so consider I gamma pi, the self-intersection matrix of pi. Consider AV as um, for each V as uh, the multiplicity MV times um, I of EV, so times I, I would better write QV like this. And uh, consider also the vector K pi defined as um, uh, the, the, the 
weight corresponding to V is 2GV plus uh, the valency of V minus 2. Valency equals the, is the number of H from V. And now I consider my two vec preferred vectors, L pi and P pi. And the Laplacian formula tells you that uh, the intersection function times the vector of MVQV equals uh, K pi plus L pi minus P pi. In other words, for any vertex V, you have this uh, equality which, uh, uh, which uh, link uh, MVQV on a vertex V to the other uh, similar data, MWQW, of the neighbor vertices. So the one for which EV intersection E uh, 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 W uh, is uh, non-zero. And on the other, uh, on, the, on the right side, you have the corresponding uh, vector there, okay? What tells you the Laplacian formula? It tells you that uh, if you take your uh, triple gamma pi, uh, L pi and P pi, okay? Then if you know gamma pi, and if you know one of these two vectors, it gives you the other one, okay? And so for example, um, uh, no, sorry, plus plus the the inner rates. If you have uh, if you have uh, uh, l pi plus the inner rates, then you you get uh, p pi. Or if you if you have p pi plus the inner rate, then you get l pi. Okay. And if you know the triple, then it determines all the inner rates. Okay. So you have several ways to use it. And in our case, what we do is that you start from uh, gamma pi and L pi, and also the third, um, the third line give you uh, the inner rate function. Therefore, you are able to um, obtain P pi. And so the complete statement of the CRM is the following. Um, so if you take an LNE normal surface germ, you can determine the uh, triple gamma pi, P pi, L pi, plus the inner rates, okay? And moreover, by a simple uh, algorithm, we can actually uh, uh, give the minimal good resolution that uh, factors through the Nash transform. Remember that at the beginning, we just have the minimal good resolution of X. So the first item tells you the one which factors through the, the blow up of the origin, which is the same. And after that, we know how to blow up further to obtain the one which factorizes through the Nash transform. So re we really uh, have the, the triple uh, plus the inner rates. Now to finish, I would like to give some examples of uh, LNE singularities. Um, so uh, for this, we need a criterion to determine, um, to determine whether uh, 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 a germ is Lipschitz normally embedded. We have, uh, a CRM by Birbrer and Mendes, which tells you that um, X is Lipschitz normally embedded if and only if for any pair of arcs, we have that the outer and inner contacts coincide. The problem is that it is very difficult to use such a criterion to determine Lipschitz normal embedding because you would have to test every pair of arcs on your object. And uh, recently, uh, with uh, Neumann and Pedersen, we proved, we proved uh, an improved version of that theorem. And uh, even more recently, with uh, uh, Lorenzo Fantini, uh, Bernd Schober, and uh, Pedersen, 
uh, we prove a, a new improvement, which tells you the following. You take a, a normal surface germ, so it is for a, a, a surface germ, and you choose one generic projection of the surface, and we are able to, 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 to determine a finite family of what we call test arcs uh, in situ, so there, at the target, such that X is Lipschitz normally embedded, if and only if, for any test arc of our finite family, uh, the, the lifting L minus one delta satisfied the following arc criterion. If you take two arcs, delta one and delta two, uh, which are uh, liftings of delta by L, then it satisfied that inner and outer contact coincides. And with this, uh, we are able to test examples. And for example, so we already had it um, several years ago, but for example, A2 and uh, XY, X plus Y plus Z4 are LNE singularities simply by this criterion. But uh, actually, we have more general surfaces, as I said before. First, uh, minimal singularities are Lipschitz normally embedded. Uh, the definition by Collar is the following. A germ of analytic space, so it's more general than surfaces, is minimal if it is reduced, when Macaulay, the tangent cone is reduced, and uh, Abiancar's inequality, this inequality is an equality. So the multiplicity is uh, greater or equal to the embedding dimension minus the dimension plus one. And um, uh, recently, we proved the following theorem. Minimal surface singularities are Lipschitz normally embedded. And conversely, any rational singularity which is normally embedded is minimal. So the difficult part is uh, to prove that minimal singularities are Lipschitz normally embedded. And the ID, the initial ID comes from this inequality, Abiancar, which has to be an equality. So if it is an equality, it tells you that the multiplicity is minimal with respect to the embedding dimension, okay? So it tells you that you will, heuristically, you will avoid to have, um, when you take a generic projection of your surface, if you take a point there, the cardinal of the fiber equals the multiplicity of the surface. And by having a large, embedding dimension with respect to the multiplicity will avoid you to have close, two close sheets um, uh, for this uh, finite cover. And having close sheets gives you bad pair of arcs with respect to the Lipschitz normal embedding. So this is the ID. But of course, it is a very er heuristic ID. And it is absolutely not what we use in the proof. In the proof, we do an induction of the number of blow-ups needed to resolve the test uh, arc or test curve. And we use um, the characterization by color of uh, minimal surface singularities, uh, which I, uh, I state here. Uh, a normal surface singularity is minimal if, um, if it is rational with reduced fundamental cycle, reduced Zmax, okay? So this, this is a first uh, uh, family of LNE singularity, but there are probably uh, a lot of other examples. For example, another big family is the super isolated singularities. These are hypersurface in C3, given by the sum of two homogeneous polynomials with a very uh, restrictive, uh, very, uh, sorry, a generic condition that uh, FD plus one equals zero intersection, the singularities of ED, FD equals zero is empty. So it, it, it is uh, for the two curves in P2, okay? And uh, 
I proved this theorem with uh, Philip Misef. A super isolated uh, singularity is LNE if and only if the singularities of its projectivized tangent cone, so the singularity of this curve, uh, consist of transversal smooth curve germs. So then you get a very uh, uh, big family of uh, LNE singularities. And I would like to say that the intersection between minimal singularities and super isolated is very small. It is just the A2 singularity. So you get uh, completely different uh, examples. And so I would like to, to stop uh, my talk uh, now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions or remarks? Do we have any uh, any idea about what happens in higher dimension? Um, uh, you mean to find the uh, LN example in higher dimension? Exactly, yes. Um, it, it's, it's not maybe, maybe the question is how rare is this L? Uh, I think I think one can find examples in higher dimension by generalizing uh, that criterion with test arc. I mean, instead of taking it, it is a general remark on uh, Lipschitz geometry. Uh, now we know a lot about uh, surfaces and we use a lot each time uh, generic projections. And I think that uh, to reach higher dimension, instead of a generic projection, one has to use um, a, a, a somehow a generic flag. So, uh, you know, a sequence of generic projections and some, do something inductively. But yes, I would imagine that one can find uh, uh, big families of LNE singularities in uh, in higher dimension. Yeah, thank you. So, can I have a question? Of course. Uh, yes, and uh, it seems you know a lot about the the LNE's property of the uh, uh, surface, right? In in C three. Yes. So, yeah. uh, for example. Not not in C3, huh? it's, uh, it's, it's we, in any dimension, in any okay. embedded dimension. Yes. Okay. okay, let's restrict ourselves to C3, for example. If we okay. have some hyper surface, which is uh, isolated singularity mm -hmm. and LNE, okay, uh, to, to a hyper surface. Can we uh, say something about the, the Lipschitz style of the term, two terms? Um, the, the uh, let, let's say, yeah, let's say uh, uh, Lipschitz style is, is mean uh, uh, not ambient, yeah, just uh, outer with outer matrix. Yes, you mean you, if you for a surface, okay, yes. if it is um, if it is uh, um, if it is uh, LNE, it LNE. means that the outer Lipschitz geometry coincides with the inner one, okay. And then uh, you have a complete invariant for that, which is a geometric decomposition that, that uh, we we drawn up with um, Birbrer and uh, and, uh, and Neumann, okay. And uh, uh, now uh, with the theorem we have with uh, um, uh, uh, Lorenzo Fantini and uh, and uh, Andre Bellotto, uh, you can. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, 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 have a, a restrictive list of graphs which can be realized by, by LNE uh, singularities. The problem is that you will not be sure to be able to realize it uh, um, anyway. But uh, yes, there, there, is a, there is a complete invariant for that. And there, is a, a, a lot of, there are a lot of restrictions. And, but we are not sure that uh, these two terms are by Lipschitz equivalent, right? For example, two term, uh, two uh, term of hyper surface in C three, which yes. with uh, LNE, and the same topological type. 
uh, are they by Leibniz equivalent? Yes, they are. They are because if they are LNE, okay, the topological yeah. type uh, gives you um, the topological type gives you uh, all the the complete invariant of the by Lipschitz geometry. What I described in the theorem, um, um, the list of invariant described in the theorem is enough to so these data, okay. This yeah. triple plus the inner rates, they are, if you know that the surface is LNE, it's enough to describe fully the, the, the Lipschitz type. And so, yes, the, the answer is yes. They have the same by Lipschitz geometry. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Maybe I have a question. Uh, it's about the theorem two. Uh, if I understood well, when uh, when it is when the x zero is LNE, it determines uh, it determines L gamma p gamma p is the topological type, and it determines also p p, and by following it determines L p uh, with the Laplacian formula. My well, question. It, well, it, yes, gamma pi is uh, gamma pi is determined uh, by the topological type it is we agree and it is the minimal good resolution okay. of x okay yes okay. you are right and uh, so my question is uh, are there some example of non lne normal surface germ such that the minimal resolution uh, does uh, factor through bl0 to the blow up of the maximal idea yes for example e8 does e8 okay Okay, E8, okay. Uh, if you, um, it's a very good question. It's, uh, and it's, I will tell you why it is a very good question. <laughs> Look, for example, uh, uh, E8, okay, factorize the, the minimal, in general, the, the, the minimal resolution of a rational singularity factorize through the, the blow up of the point. Okay. Okay. And, um, and, uh, um, Actually, uh, yes, it's, it, is far from, it is far from being sufficient. Uh, and actually, um, uh, an underlying condition is that um, uh, if you have an LNE singularity, uh, 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 let me, yes. Um, um, no, I, I, I will say something wrong, so I don't say it. But the, the answer is that, yes, there, there is a, it's not sufficient. Uh, you have non-LNE singularities, which uh, whose uh, minimal singularity fight factors through the blow up of the origin. And even through the Nash transform, it is absolutely not sufficient to have LNE. Uh, so the, my question is uh, in the theorem true. Why don't the, uh, we could replace uh, the hypothesis LNE by there exists a, a pi such uh, there exists a minimum uh, the, the minimal resolution factors to the, the the blow up of the maximal ideal? No, it's too weak. No, it's too weak. It's too weak. For example, no, no. For example, e, uh, uh, if you take E eight, mm -hmm. If you take E eight, as I showed before. You cannot determine uh, p pi. Okay. 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 We cannot, uh, but we can determine. I don't understand. We for e eight, we can determine l pi with gamma pi. No. No, I cannot. I have to use the equation. Okay. Uh, in order to get that polar curve, uh, that uh, resolution of the family of polar curves after two blow up, I have to use the equation. Okay. So I use the analytical type. Okay. Thanks. Very good question, Guinea. Thank you. Are there any others? Uh, if not, we can speak. Uh, we can thank uh, Anega. May, may I take the occasion to 
to introduce Yeni, who just asked a question on whose theorem was uh, cited by Lorenzo right. yesterday. So Yeni Sherik is our uh, PhD student of uh, André Bellotto and myself. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Hello, Yeni. Hello. A bientôt. A bientôt. A bientôt. <laughs> Hello everyone, I hope this talk uh, finds everyone safe and healthy in this very hard moment that we all are living with this pandemic situation in our, in our world, so uh, I hope this situation ends as soon as possible. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizing committee for the invitation to be here and, and talk about my work, which is a joint work with, with Professor Terence Gaffney. And uh, I'll talk about the projective uh, analytic spectrum of the double of a module. Uh, it's a work that its main goal is to look for algebraic conditions to study uh, Lipschitz things and by Lipschitz geometry and mainly by Lipschitz singularity. And, uh, Professor Gaffney probably will talk more about other things uh, in the next talk. So I will just talk about the projective analytic spectrum. But uh, uh, before to start, I will make some definitions and basic definitions of, of the double mainly because it's the main tool that uh, I will, I will uh, develop here. So I will turn off my camera. I, I don't think you need to see my face. Uh, from now from now on. So as I said before, this is a joint work with, in progress with uh, Professor Gaffney. We are working uh, in some of these things uh, yet. So uh, I will fix some notations with you here, just to make clear some some of the things that we'll talk about. Uh, Z1 to Zn will uh, denote as the coordinate functions on Cn. Uh, X for us here is a complex analytic space in on Cn. Uh, delta x is the diagonal on x cross x, and, and uh, we'll need to work in the product of x with itself. So uh, many times we'll need to work on Cn times Cn, and in this in this case we will denote the second n coordinates here by z prime one z prime n. Okay. Uh, OX is the sheesh of holomorphic functions over X, uh, which is a sheesh of algebras of uh, the complex numbers, the field of complex numbers. Pi 1 and Pi 2 are the projections map onto, onto each factor. Uh, JMX is the Jacobian module of X, so X uh, being an analytic space is defined by some F, and uh, this map F has its partial derivatives and we look to this uh, partial derivatives and for the submodule generated by by them. Uh, M, this fancy M here, is the sheaf of submodules of OXP. P is just a natural number here. Uh, with generic rank K. And PR is the projective space uh, over C with dimension R. So originally, uh, Professor Gaffney first defined the double for a shift of ideals of OX. Uh, he was working to describe by Lipschitz a singularity of a family of hypersurfaces. So he looked to the double and uh, the integral closure of ideals and modules, and one kind of infinitesimal conditions uh, comes up, which is very similar to a condition that describes Whitney singularity. Then we generalize these notions for modules and uh, its correspondent conditions for our family of analytic varieties. So we define the double for a module, not uh, only for ideas. And this infinitesimal condition uh, is generic, 
Professor Grafner will tell more about that in the next talk. And there is a relation with strongly by Lipschitz equivalence and Mostowski stratification, but here I will not talk more about because this is main subject of Professor Grafner's talk. Well, let's define the double. Anyway, what is the double? So, if you take a global section H on OXP, find on X, the double of H it's just uh, take H and compose with pi 1, which is the projection on to the first factor, and take H composed to pi 2. And you take the despair. Despair belongs to OXX xx uh, 2p because here we have a map from xx to oxp and here oxp as well so this guy here is in uh, oxx 2p it's a global set of this sheaf of three modules with rank 2p if you take a point on the product with x with itself the double in a point is the age on each coordinate of this point if you we look to this point as a pair of points of x so uh, this is the double and uh, we can define the double of a module in the same way in the in a very natural way we define the double of m as the sheaf of the sub modules of of oxx 2p generated by all the doubles of global sections of m of the original uh, sheaf m right and in this way, this definition is a generalization of the definition of Gaffney for a shift of ideals. And in the case of ideals, we have a notion of Lipschitz saturations for ideals, uh, given by Fon and Tessier. And uh, in this approach, Gaffney uh, obtained a link between the integral closure of the double of uh, an ideal and the Lipschitz saturations of this ideal. So, uh, a theorem proved by Gaffney, is one element belong to the Lipschitz saturation of an ideal I if and only if the double of this element belongs to the integral closure of the double of the ideal I. So we have here a link between the integral closure plus double with the Lipschitz saturation of an ideal. So we use this theorem and uh, some equivalent conditions that we have for the integral closure for ideals and modules, and we extend the, the notion of Lipschitz saturation for modules in some different uh, ways. So, uh, using these things, uh, we define the first Lipschitz saturations of M as uh, the sheaf generated by, by global sections, H, such that the double of this global section belongs to the, the integral closure of the module given by the double of M. Right, so this first uh, Lipschitz saturations is uh, inspired by this theorem from Gaffney. And the second one, we have, uh, if you replace the Lipschitz saturation here uh, of psi m by the integral closure, this will become an equivalent condition for h belonging to the integral closure of m. So we replace the integral closure here by the Lipschitz saturations and this will define what we called here the second Lipschitz saturation of M. And, and uh, the third Lipschitz saturation comes from the minor, minor's condition for the integral closure. So we replace the integral closure here by the Lipschitz saturation of this ideal, which is the ideal generated by all the k by k minors of a matrix of generators of M. And uh, this inclusion will define what we call here the, the third lip saturation of M. So we have here at least three ways to extend the notion of lip saturations of an ideal for modules. Uh, if P here is equal one, all these three conditions here are equivalent. Uh, but in general, we have that the first lip saturations is, is stronger than the second one, and the second one is stronger than the third one. And uh, so this happened in the in any point of X, and in general, we have a generic equivalence. So we we know that we proved that there exists a dense Zariski open subset U of X such that these three sheaves here uh, are equal along this U along this open subset U. It means that uh, in this Zariski open subset, uh, the stocks of this these uh, three sheaves 
uh, agree. It's, it's the same thing. And uh, well, there is a work to do here uh, yet because, uh, for example, we know that uh, the first lip saturation is strictly stronger than the third one, but we don't know if uh, the first one and the second one could be equal in general. Uh, we are working in this uh, yet, but uh, I really want to talk about the analytic projective uh, spectrum of the double. So we're gonna do that. So if you know how to generate the M with global sections, we generate the double. Taking the doubles of the generators and elements of this nature here. In the first P coordinates, you, ju you, you just take zeros, and in the second one, you take the difference between the coordinates. So here is zi minus zi prime, if you, if you rather in this way, times the pullback of the jth generator of m. So this set here will be a generator set of the double of m. So, and this set is called the generator set of the doubling dust by the generator set of the original module. And uh, this kind of set of generator will be very useful to describe the stock of the double in a point which is not in the diagonal of x. So, if you consider x, uh, x prime in the product of x with itself, with x different from x x prime we can describe the stock of the double at x x prime as the direct sum of the pullback of the stock of m at x with the pullback by pi 2 uh, of the stock of m in the second coordinate of this point in the product of x with itself okay and this equation here, we can look at the main case here, the, the, the main example that we have to keep on, on our mind is uh, when the, the module here, M, is equal to the Jacobian module of X. So, in this particular case here where X is a family of complex varieties and M is the Jacobian module of, of this X, uh, we can translate this equation here as this one. It's the same thing, but uh, replacing M by the Jacobian module. And this will provide one additional motivation for the double, because uh, the Jacobian module carries information about the tangent space of points of X, provided th these points are regular, are the smooth points of X. So in this case, if you want to control the Lipschitz behavior of, the, of two uh, tangent space at two different points, uh, it would be nice if our structure contains uh, information about the individual tangent hyperplane at each point of this pair x x prime. This is what is happening here. This equation tells us uh, that the double of the Jacobian module in some way contains the, the Jacobian module on x and in the Jacobian module on x prime. So this is an important thing to consider here. For an answer to this question, we need to look for the main case here, to the motivation case here, which is the Jacobian module. So we assume that X is defined by analytic map, F, so X is the pre-image of zero here, uh, JMX is the submodule generated by the, all the partial derivatives of F. And if you are working uh, with Lipschitz things, uh, in some sense we would like to know what happens uh, in this case here with two different tangent spaces or tangent, tangent hyperplanes on two points, different points, as they come together. So uh, we need to look uh, at these things. And uh, one good way to approach this problem is to look for limiting tangent hyperplanes for it. So if you, will look, if you want to look for limiting tangent hyperplanes, we have to look for sequences, sequence of points in this way. 
right? We have we need points. We need a uh, smooth points of x because we need to look to tangent hypers of uh, to tangent spaces of of x in some points, and we want to look at tangent hyperplane, which is hyperplanes that contains the tangent space at a point. So we need to look of sequence of points in this form. But a hyperplane of CN can be defined by an, an, an equation like this. Okay, so these coefficients here on complex numbers defines uh, once one of them is not zero defines uh, one element of the projective space over over C over the complex number. So we can naturally identify the hyperplanes of CN with points on the projective space over C, right? So we can identify this edge here with this uh, point on the projective space. And uh, making this, this inclusion here uh, is the same thing that uh, this n apple here to belong to the orthogonal space associated to the tangent space, right? Uh, but linear algebra says that the orthogonal space here is the row space of this Jacobian matrix. Right, so this is the same thing that says the point x age so can be taken on this form when x can be the same thing, but uh, the hyperplane age we replace by this point on the project space over C identified with this hyperplane, where this point is a smooth point of x and this uh, vector here inside the project space is a vector in the row space of the this matrix, the Jacobian matrix, right? Because if L1, Ln belongs to this, and this orthogonal space is the row space of the Jacobian matrix, we have this. So if we consider all these points here, it will define a subset, a subset of x cross to the projective space in n minus one dimension. And, with, and the, if we take the topological closure of this subset of points formed like this, it will capture limiting tangent hyperplanes of X, right? So we can extend this construction for N module in the first way, and then we can see how the, these objects are translated to the Jacobian module on each time. So uh, from now on, we assume that M is a sheaf, generated by global sections, G1, GR. We are already assuming that the generic rank of M is K. So we proved that if M has generic rank K, the double will have generic rank 2K. So, so the generic rank of the double is the double of the generic rank. Uh, with this hypothesis, we define what we mean by the matrix associated to this set of generators. So the matrix MX for us here will be a PR matrix with uh, complex entries given by the jth, uh, for example, the first column of this matrix will be the G1X, right? Because G1 is a map from X to CP. So G1X has P entries. So we have P uh, rows in this matrix and R columns. So this matrix here will be uh, the matrix MX. And we will denote row MX naturally as the row space of this matrix here. Right? So this is a linear subspace of CR. And then we define the singular set of M uh, is, the, is, a subset, is a subset of X formed by points where the rank of this matrix here is not maximal, right? Because the, the maximal rank here is k, because k is the generic rank of m. So we collect all the points such that the rank is not maximal. If we look to the Jacobian module case, it will mean that we don't have a submersion or we don't have maximal rank, which uh, is equivalent to have a singular point of x, right? So, uh, with this information, we can uh, describe, we described here the singular set of the double. Uh, 
this set here will be formed by the diagonal of x and any pair of the diagonal in order to belong to the singular set of the double one of the points if you call here x and x prime one of them necessarily has to belong to the singular set of m right so we can describe the singular set of the double in terms of the diagonal and the singular set of the original module now the problem will comes up because uh, if we fix some notation here rm is the Riesz algebra of m uh, the set um for us here is the set of uh, formed by points in this way so the, aff the affine part is a point of x and the projective part here is a point of p r minus 1 r here is the number of generators that we are considering for m right so we look for points in this set here such that the matrix mx has maximal rank right which is the same thing that says x is not in the singular set of m is the same thing and the vector l here belongs to the row space of this matrix so it's just a generalization for our motivational case uh, which is the jacobian module and that the project will be the topological closure of the set here on x cross pr minus 1 right so the project uh, define finds a natural projection right like this which takes this pair onto to the affine part of this of this pair all right and we really want to investigate the fibers of this map here and the fiber in a point x we denote the in this uh, very natural way so this is the project of the Riesz algebra of n module and uh, we would like to see how to describe the proj of the double, uh, if you have a sheesh M, one good question is how are the points of the proj of the Riesz algebra of the double? We just say the proj of the double for it. So first thing, uh, we need to see where the proj of the double lives. So the double is a sheesh defined on x cross x. And uh, here we need to know a number of generators for the double. So uh, with these two information, we're gonna know where the project of the double lives. So uh, first, the, the generator set of the double induced by a fixed uh, generator set of M uh, has R plus NR elements. We already see that in that proposition, which gives us uh, a set of generators for the double. So now we can see the project of the double in this space here, right? Because the double is a shift defined on x cross x and the double has r plus nr generators. So it's just following these, these steps here, right? And in this way we can obtain a more friendly presentation for the project of the double, like this. So, if we consider the open subset associated to the double of M, the project of the double will be the closure of the set here, the closure uh, taken on this x cross x cross the projective space with the correct size, and the points of this open subset will be in this form here. The affine part will have x, x prime and in the projective part we have r plus n r homogeneous coordinates, right? So here u and u prime are vectors on CR and here we have n times r coordinates here, right? Because each of these uh, guys here has r coordinates, so you, you have r coordinates n times, so n r, right? And we can describe the project of the double like this. Uh, n point of here, it's a limit of a sequence of points like this. Here x1, xn are the coordinates of x, right? And x1 prime and xn prime are the coordinates of x prime. And this set here, 
are formed by uh, points of this way where the rank of the matrix associated to x and x prime has maximal rank which in this case is 2k because we already see that so we can see that if the matrix of the double associated to the point x x prime has a rank 2k so each of this point if we consider the the matrix of m on x and m on x prime both will have maximal rank k right and this condition here l belongs to the row space if we translate this in the double case this will be equivalent to ask that u in the row space of mx and u prime is in the row space of mx prime so it's a it's a nice uh, description because we can describe the points of the Zariski open subset of the project in terms of information of these points concerned to the original module M. And one additional nice thing here is that the difference of the coordinates of X and X primes appears in this description. It's a nice thing because in Lipsch things we need to look to difference like this so we can hope that this kind of descriptions will give us some relevant uh, information about Lipschitz things and if we translate this result for the Jacobian module case which is the most important case here we are gonna have this result here it's the same thing but I replaced the M by JMX the Jacobian module of X so the project of the double of the Jacobian module is formed by points which is limit uh, of sequences of points like this and these two conditions here can be translated in this case just telling that uh, we have two different smooth points of X and this last uh, condition here says that the hyperplane associated to U contains the tangent space on X and the hyperplane associated to U prime contains the tangent space of X on X prime right so it's a nice translation to the most important case here and back into the general case we can see that this equation here take us to consider a shift we will call 2m because this part here on the right hand side is exactly the stock of the direct sum of these two sheaves here the pullback of m by pi 1 and the pullback of m by pi 2 right so we're gonna call this shift 2m and now this equation here tells us that the stock of the double and the stock of this sheet here are the same provided the point x x prime is not uh, a point of the diagonal of x and we can see we can inve investigate what this equation here will reveal in the progeny level i mean if uh, we take the project of the double and the project of the 2m one good question is uh, are there some relation between these guys? Uh, we can answer this question. Uh, first, we need to give a description of this prod here in a similar way that we have done for the double. And to do that, we need a set of generators of 2M because we need to know a number of a set of generators to look at the prod embedded in a space. So we have two R elements that generate 2M, right? Because here we can just take the pullback by pi 1 of the generators of M and 0 on the second coordinate and here we make the reverse. So this will be a set of generators of 2M. This set here has 2R elements so we can consider the project embedded in this set here. And uh, as we have done before for the double we can describe the project of 2M like this. The project is the closure of the set of points like this where x and x prime are different points of x mx and mx prime have maximal rank have rank k which is the generic rank of m and u belongs to the row space of x and u prime same thing for the x prime and this description will be very helpful to construct a map between the fibers if we consider a point of the diagonal a point x x prime with x different from x prime we can construct a natural map between this fiber here and this fiber here in this way and we have an inverse for this map which will be something like this this i here it's some i such that x y is different from x i prime and this map here will not depend on the choice of this i such that the i coordinates of this point are different 
So we have an isomorphism between these two fibers, right? And we can use here the join of two topological spaces in order to describe this prod of 2M because we can consider in, uh, canonical inclusions here. We can see the fiber of the prod of M inside the fiber of the same X here. And the same thing we do for X prime. So we have a canonical inclusion here. And we can prove that this diagram here is a homotopic colimit of the diagram of this canonical projection here. And because the colimit is a unique up to isomorphism, we get the theorem, the proj, the fiber of the proj of the double in a point, which is not in the diagonal of X, is isomorphic to the join of the fibers on each point. So we can describe the fiber in this pair as the joint of the each fiber on the original module. So this is a translation in the level of the proj of this equality of the, of this equation here. So this equation here in the proj level reveals that the fiber of the proj is the topological joint of each fiber, right? And together with the double, other modules related to the double comes up. Because uh, from this set of generators of M, we may consider other sheaves of modules. The first one is the reduced double, which is the sheaf of submodules generated just by the doubles of the generators, right? And the extended double, uh, we consider the reduced double. This is a submodule of the three sheaf on XX with rank 2P. And we can consider this submodule here. This is a formal way to look at the pullback of M as a submodule of OXX2P. And you take the sum of these submodules here, inside here, and consider the sum as a submodule, and we call this the extended double of M. And uh, with these definitions, it's natural to see that the reduced double uh, is in the double, original double. The double is in the extended double, and the extended double is in 2M. 2M will have this chain of uh, inclusions here. And uh, now it's interesting to investigate how these four sheaves are different among them. How they differ, or if they differ. So we will compare these two guys here first. For this case, we have a isomorphism because the extended double here also has two R generators. Uh, if you look back here, here we have R generators for the reduced double, and this guy here has other R generators. So we have at least two R generators for the extended double, so we are allowed to look for the proj of the, the, proj of the extended double inside this space, which is exactly the same space where we look to the proj of the 2M. And we get natural isomorphism between the proj of the 2M and the proj of the extended double. Natural in this way here. We get an uh, isomorphism which agrees with the two projections, right? And now we can add the original double in the story. So let's put these three guys together. How are we gonna do that? So we will uh, fix some notation here. So T1, TR and T prime 1, T prime R are the local homogeneous coordinates on this project space. Uh, I will consider F, the sheaf of ideals of, on the proj of the extended double generated by the first T coordinates for the project spaces. In the second part, I will consider the difference between the affine coordinates multiplied by the last R coordinates on the project space. So we can consider the blow up map defined by this shift of ideals on the extended double. So uh, we have an inclusion of graded algebras here because this inclusion here, uh, let me go back here, okay. Here we have an inclusion of the three last module here. This inclusion of modules will induce an inclusion of graded algebras, right? And this inclusion here will induce a commutative diagram like this. So PF here is the blow up map. Uh, this is the isomorphism that we already get. We just get uh, right now. Uh, this vertical map here is the is the projection associated to the proj, right? Here is the projection associated to the proj of the double. Here is the proj of the extended double. And this map here 
is the map of projects uh, in this by this inclusion here okay and this one will be the composition of these two guys okay so we have this this diagram and if we get a diagram with all these guys in right so if you look back here how we define the this shift of ideals uh, you notice that the generators of this shift of ideals are very similar to the generators of the double of M. Uh, here in the double, in the double, we get the doubles of the generators of M, and in this part here, the, we have the difference on the on the coordinates multiplied by the pullback of the generators of M. So this set of generators of F are very similar to the set of generators of the double. So we could ask if this similarity of on these generators will reveal something in this diagram here. And we're gonna see that this similarity will provide that the exceptional divisor of this blow up will be taken in the exceptional fiber of the project. By the definition of F, we see that if we consider the closed subset of this project, defined by F, defined by the shift of ideals F, the projection associated to the extended double will take the closed subset of F in the diagonal of X. So we have this inclusion. Uh, remember that the diagonal is inside the singular set of the double of M. So this diagram here shows what's going on here. And uh, if we call EFD hat the exceptional divisor of the blow up and uh, ED the exceptional fiber, of the project, we're gonna have this diagram here, right? Because the exceptional divisor of the blow up, it's uh, it's inside here, and the exceptional fiber of the project is inside here, and we use this inclusion here to conclude that the exceptional divisor of the project is taken by P. I called this this uh, this projection here. I just denote by P, okay? And this P here takes the exceptional divisor of the of the blow up in the exceptional fiber of the project because by definition we have these two uh, equations here and this last inclusion here will tell us tells us that this diagram here preserves the exceptional divisor going to the exceptional fiber of the project now i'm almost finishing here uh, we're going to see how this construction of the project can be able to produce common tangent hyperplanes, which is a important subject if we are investigate the behavior of two tangent hyperplanes. So, in order to do that, we're gonna look for a very specific closed subset of the project of the extended double, which is the, the subset defined by T1 TR. This is a closed subset of the project of the extended double, and uh, Points on this closed subset naturally can be described li like this. So if you assume that this point belongs to the open subset associated to the extended double, then first mx and mx prime will have maximal rank. Zero u prime will belong to the row space of this matrix here, uh, but this will mean that uh, that u prime belongs to the intersection of the row space of mx and x prime, and uh, we can see what this will mean in the Jacobian module case. So in this case, we have uh, if m is the Jacobian module of x, uh, the, the Jacobian matrix have maximal rank on x and x prime because in this case mx is the Jacobian matrix on x is the same thing for x prime. So, if the Jacobian matrix have maximal rank on x and x prime, it means that x and x prime are smooth points of x. And this last condition here, if you say that u prime is in the row space of the Jacobian matrix of x and x prime, we already saw today that uh, the hyperplane associated to the u prime contains the tangent spaces associated to x. And the hyperplane associated to u prime contains a tangent space associated to the x prime, right? So h u prime it's a common tangent hyperplane of x at, at these two points. So this proj of the extended double, one of the closed subset of it, it's able to capture common tangent hyperplanes.
which is very nice if we are looking for the behavior of a pair of tangent hyperplane, right? So, so we're still working on these things. We, we have more to tell, but I think I'll stop here. And thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, thank you, Thiago. Thank you. Are there any questions? So, uh, Tiago, uh, is uh, this uh, uh, these constructions that you presented are they motivated by uh, uh, Lipschitz equisingularity? Do you uh, intend to apply these constructions to Lipschitz equisingularity? Uh, yes, uh, I have to say that I'm I'm in a very comfortable situation now because. Uh, once Professor Gaffner will will talk now about some works that we're doing, ah. I'm not sure if he will talk about this now, but uh, I can tell that uh, the, the the main the, the main goal here is to look for the fiber where the this this shift of modules is the is the Jacobian module, and then uh, if we fix the point a uh, uh, a singular point. Probably, uh, we hope that the, this fiber will capture some uh, kind of invariant for Lipsch things. Maybe the number of the vanishing cusps uh, that uh, these things we are looking for. But I, I'm afraid to tell something more and, and give some spoiler to, to first okay. of the talk. But uh, after, we, we, I can tell more, I think, I think. Okay, but yes, uh, in in in, the, in in this talk, I I really uh, wanted to present some preliminary general results. So what what can we do in general for a shift of modules in a in a quickly way, and then uh, maybe use the, this information to apply for the Jacobian module and see what happens for the study on by Lipschitz equisingularity. Other questions? I think Professor Sidinha uh, has a question. I, 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 I saw in the chat here. Yes, uh, Tiago, uh, my question is the following. Uh, related to the by Lipschitz equisingularity, one has to consider uh, equisingularity of families of analytic sets, and also uh, by Lipschitz equisingularity of families of maps. And uh, in this second context, it's important to look at uh, the Jacobian model uh, as a submodel of the whole ring ON. Yes. So um, it's okay, right? So, but I think the main question is whether in this situation, we also have uh, uh, the generic property, but of course, uh, this will be considered by Terry, I think, in his, in his talk. My question is just, yeah. it's okay to look at the Jacobian model as a oh, submodel uh, of the whole ring, right? Yes, yes, yes. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so... Any other question? So if not, we we thank you. Uh, thank you. Again. Thank you. So if, you, if you do not stand in front of it, Terry, then we can read. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there it's fine. There it's fine. Yeah. So now we start the second uh, talk of this afternoon. The speaker is Terry Gaffner from uh, Northeastern University, and he's going to talk about infinitely Lipschitz equisingularity. So Terry, you, you can start. Uh, should I stop the noise? Thank you very much uh, to the organizers of the conference for inviting me to talk. And I ask the patience of the audience as I am not so well tooled in these methods but we'll do the best we can. So first I want to talk about the, the setup that I'm using. It's very similar to the one that Tiago was using in his last talk. So XD is a, 
I'm going to be a member of a family. Curly X will denote a family. This is the number of parameters that the family is based on, and that's the dimension of the fibers. All spaces are equidimensional with equidimensional fibers. Um, y is the base of our, our deformation here. MY is the ideal defined by the, the Z coordinates, the ambient coordinates. Capital F is the defining equation for our family, and the value of F at Y defines the, the fibers. If I put a subscript here, that means it's the relative Jacobian module, as it's the partial of F with respect to the ambient variables. And of course, if I restrict to just X, then have a zero as a subscript, and that gives me the Jacobian module. One other piece of notation that is helpful is to write uh, delta F to mean the difference of a function at two different points. So I would like to talk about Lipschitz Infant, I'd like to actually talk about infinitesimal Lipschitz equisingularity. Infinitesimal refers to concepts based on vector fields, tangent planes, their limits, and associated ideals and, and modules. And the, the model for what I'm doing here is Whitney equisingularity. of ideas that I first encountered in the work of Bernard Tessier. So in this subject, if I look at the ideal that defines y and I multiply that by the Jacobian module in the absolute case, or uh, you can use the relative Jacobian module in the relative case, this is a good infinitesimal object. why it's the good infinitesimal object. I just want to focus on, on two of them here. The first is that if you look at the progen of the idea that defines y times the full Jacobian module of our family, then this is the blow up by the pullback of the idea that defines y times the co-normal of a family. So this means that the fiber over y comma zero tracks limiting tangent hyperplanes secant lines. And then secondly, there exists a cover Field. 
which is rugose if it's Whitney. existence of these vector fields, at least in the hypersurface case, gives you something that SCA showed us how to assemble into a non-analytic but a global vector field that trivialized the family. If we stick at the level of this cover, then we have vector fields which remain complex analytic and perhaps are easier to work with. Well, maybe it's better to say the meromorphic. So, we would like to, to see to what extent we can develop these ideas for the Lipschitz case. You need to move your camera. Oh, move the camera. camera. Or maybe move it back a little. Yeah. So the starting point of what I was doing. Whoops. idea that Thiago talked about in his last in his talk. And uh, the idea is that as we call H is contained in the Lipschitz saturation of I if when we compose it with a map from the Lipschitz saturation of the blow up of X by I. So let me write that down. Now this is contained in pullback of. So let me explain what pi S is. So we start with the blow up of X by I, and then we form the saturation of that. And then the composite down to x, this map here is what I'm calling by s. So we take, we take our ideal, which is down here on x, we pull it back up to the saturation, and then we go to see which elements from x also live in the saturation. And the set of such elements is i sub s. The property that they have, well, let's explain that. So I'll explain it with an example. This is contained in the saturation of the Jacobian ideal of X. That's to J. Of X. 
and it's in the saturation here. And we want to see what that means. Well, what the saturation of a space gives us is that this guy here, when we view it as a meromorphic element here, it has the property that when we write it in terms of the pullback of I, then the coefficient functions are Lipschitz with respect to the coordinates on this space. So now I just want to write that down. So on UI, UI is going to be the set, which is the, uh, which lies over the set of points where the partial of F with respect to, to uh, ZI dominates the other partial derivatives. And then what we have is that if I look at the partial, if I look at the, the difference here, of partial of f with respect to y divided by the partial of f with respect to zi. So this is, remember, this is this thing evaluated at two points. So I guess I should put my points in here, sorry. saying is that the change of this ratio is commensurate with the change of the partials of f with respect to the fiber coordinates. And it may be that we're lucky enough that this rate of change is less than these guys. Notice what it means. If this difference were to be bounded by the difference of the points, then that would mean that these things, which are the coefficients of the canonical vector field we saw in the Whitney case, they would in fact be Lipschitz. But that's, that might be too much to hope for. And uh, this picture is an attempt to explain why. Hmm. So here we're approaching a singular point. I want you to think of this as being one of the fibers in our map. And we see that close to the singularity, the tangent hyperplane is changing very fast. Probably quite a bit faster than the distance between the points 
and changing. So what this condition is going to say is that the tangent hyperplanes to the total space x are moving along as we approach the singular points about as fast as the tangent hyperplanes on the fiber. Nothing strange is happening at the level of the family as we go in towards the origin. And this certainly is a reasonable condition that we really would expect to have if we had a family that was by Lipschitz trivial. Okay. Now, there is a problem with this uh, definition in that in order to actually do computations, you have to use the blow up of x by i. That is inconvenient to work with. And furthermore, as I've explained it, it only seems to work for ideals. We haven't really figured out the best way to save this for module ship. And so we are, are led to look at a notion which is the same in the ideal case, but which generalizes easily to the module case, and that is using the double of a module. Is this noise coming from your room? I'm afraid so. They're moving some furniture in a classroom nearby. Okay, okay. Terry, we need the camera uh, moved a little bit, yeah, to the left. Thanks. A little bit more. So this is going to make sure if and only if the uh, if the partial of f with respect to the yi is doubled. Is contained in the integral 
closure of the relative Jacobian ideal. And that, of course, has to be doubled with respect to y. And then, as Tiago said in his talk, in the ideal case, this gives us back the notion of saturation that we started with. It implies that the partial, in the ideal case, implies the partial map with respect to yi is contained in the saturation of the relative Jacobian module uh, of the Jacobian ideal at all points. So, what properties does this idea enjoy? And uh, the theorem here can be found in a preprint on the archive dating back to 2019. So x and y are in the setup. Exist a Z open subset of Y. So this is exactly the condition that you would hope to have. And in fact, it's anytime you have an equisingularity condition, it must be true, otherwise it's not very good. The proof that appears in this 2019 paper is inspired by the proof of Tessier for showing that Condition C is a generic condition in the hypersurface case. The module technology allows us to extend all those notions so we can prove a theorem. So I don't want to talk about the proof of this today. I want to talk about the proof of a corollary because the proof of this corollary will show us why we are so interested in the proj, proj n of the, of the Riesz algebra of our our object. Suppose we can control the dimension of the fiber of the proj.
this, the fiber of this over zero, zero, zero. In other words, y is zero, and the two end points in the product of x and y are zero, two. But supposing we know that this dimension is less than or equal to two D plus two R minus two, where R is the generic rank of A and Z and X. Uh, let's use the same notation for our twos. If we have this nice bound on the dimension of this fiber, and I should point out that this is about what you would expect the dimension of the fiber of just x, of the absolute case, to be. If we have this bound, then what is now true is corollary is that ILA holds or actually it holds, let's say it this way, it holds along all of Y. This is not too surprising because the module technology allows you to start with a Zariski open set and then given some condition, you can show that the set of bad points don't exist. They just go away. So this result says that, all right, you really want to understand what this thing is. We want to understand what it is so we can control it. If we can control it, if we can show that it's found the dimension of it in a nice way, then we have a way of getting ILA. So I want to talk about how the proof of this works. And the proof is based on the Kleiman Thorup theorem. So let's write that down over here. Terry, yes. you need to adjust the camera. We're too far to the right. Yeah, I'm gonna write, okay, a little bit more here. Yeah, that's fine. E be the inverse image of W, 
And C is the map that sends the proj of the reset algebra of M down to X. Terry, we need the camera to the right a little bit. Oh, OK, thank you. Yeah, it's that's fine. The theorem is if M bar is not equal to N bar, then E has the maximum dimensional possible. Maximum dimensional possible is d plus e minus 1. That's the dimension of the proj. And then I would have to subtract 1 because uh, it's a sub subset. So d plus e minus 2 is the magic number. And so we do this proof, and it's just a straightforward computation here. We're going to let n, that's the bigger module, that will be equal to the relative Jacobian module of x double relative to y. And then we're going to adjoin the partial derivatives of f with respect to i, and we double that relative to y also. So we add all those partial derivatives into M. And then by genericity, so here's where we use our theorem. Harry, you need to so turn the camera to the left now. Thank you, Tony. I just forgot again. OK. Whoops. Yeah, good. yeah good. that's good. No, 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 no. What's good before? See, one of the problems I have is that when you guys are talking, I can't really see what I got here. But uh, we'll just model through as best we can. Let me go a little bit more this way. Good, 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 good. So, so by genericity, we know that m bar equals n bar on a z open subset. estimate the size of E. So in estimating the size of E, well, what do we have? The dimension of the W is less than or equal to K minus 1, because K is the dimension of Y. And so for E, dimension of E is less than or equal to k minus 1, which is the start dimension of y, plus the dimension of the fiber over 0, which is 2d plus 2r minus 2. And so we get the whole thing looks like 2d plus k. That's the dimension of my ambient space plus 2r minus 1. That's the, that gives us the dimension of the proj, and then it's minus 2. So we see that in this case, e is too small to impede the partial of f with respect to y being in the interval closure. And so we're done. So this is really a justification for using the module technology. We have these techniques which are well understood, which we can apply to get results. Now, if I do 
just have just two more minutes. I want to stay one more result. So this is about necessity. And so we're going to let uh, uh, the theorem is so I think we have H M contained in well it doesn't matter just some space X P and L of X is the ring of Lipschitz functions maybe I'll put an X in here we need the camera a little bit to the left. Yep, that's fine. This is the ring of Lipschitz functions at x. As soon as I write this down, I have stepped out of the complex analytic category. But nonetheless, because of the properties of integral closure, we can still say something. So the theorem is that if H is contained in M times these new functions, then that implies that H is contained in the double. And basically the proof is surprisingly simple. Harry, these are meromorphic functions, right? No, no. Anything. Just a function defined on X, which happens to be Lipschitz. <coughs> okay. So what did you write? Uh, H, you know, H is in, I can't read. Yeah, H is contained in, you take your module and you want to multiply by this, this ring uh, oh. Lipschitz functions. Okay. Okay. Um, and basically, because H is analytic, it is still going to be strong enough to imply that H is contained in the integral closure of the double. And how does the proof go? Well, I'm, I'm just about out of, I'm out of time, but I just want to say just a, a, a few words about the proof. The idea is that. We use the analytic inequality technology and we can rework our expression for H so that the inequalities contain terms of the form alpha of x1 minus alpha of x2 or now notice that these of course are not going to be the differences of analytic functions but nonetheless because they're Lipschitz we can bound them in terms of analytic functions here and this being able to rework the expressions in these inequalities where we can replace the ugly terms with analytic terms is the reason why the result works. And so as a corollary to this, we know that Vostovsky has constructed, oops, Factor fields C say for which partial of F 
With respect to y, it's going to be, well, maybe yi. Well, all right. So let's just assume we just have one just for simplicity since we're running out of time. Partial number with respect to y is equal to summation ci times the partial of f with respect to the xj. We need the camera to the right. Yep. To the right. So almost there. Uh, in the Snosky result, this is, again, not a complex analytic thing, but these are Lipschitz. And so we can use this argument here to show that, in fact, H is contained in the double. So this is a, re this is a really strong statement of necessity. It says if you have any hopes of getting a stratification that is trivial by vector fields, you must have this double condition holding. And that's all I want to say today, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions? Or remarks? Uh, so we, we, we still don't know if this condition, infinitesimal conditions, leads to uh, a Lipschitz sufficient condition. That's what you want. You want a sufficient condition, right? Yeah. And uh, these techniques have been used to show families of space curves satisfy the or by Lipschitz. You have to tweak them some. Um, whether this will be sufficient, I think. It's not clear. I'm starting to think that although it's great that they're necessary, they, they may not be sufficient yet. But I think we're on the road to getting a condition that is, although maybe we aren't there yet. Okay. It would be wonderful if we understood what the fiber of the project was. What, what is the fiber? What's the fiber of the? Of the projective analytic spectrum of the double. We know what it is at smooth points, and we know what it is in the diagonal, but what it is at singular points, we don't really understand yet. As Thiago said, it, at smooth points, where the two points are distinct, they are the given by the join of the tangent hyperplanes at the two points. Uh, if you are on the diagonal, it's interesting that the, the, the uh, at least in the hypersurface case, I can show you that the, the second intrinsic, or the intrinsic derivative of f comes into, it comes into play. And we get something that looks like the graph over a secant line of the second, of the intrinsic derivative restricted to the secant. So there are interesting things going on, but as I said, we don't really understand what the origin is. Are there other questions? So we can thank uh, Gary again. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's start our uh, last talk of this afternoon session. The speaker is Brian Ebler from University of uh, Wisconsin, and he's going to talk about enhanced in shifts and vanishing cycles at fixed angle. So you can start, there, Brian. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to thank the organizers. Um, wish I could uh, be there with you guys in France, but hopefully, you know, the end of this year or next year, we can all travel again safely and not have to worry about all this as much, at least. Um, right, so the title and kind of subject of this talk is um, this fairly recent framework of uh, enhanced in sheaves, whatever that means, um, which is sort of, it's the language of this new um, Riemann-Hilbert correspondence for holonomic D modules with irregular singularities. So if you're familiar with regular holonomic D modules and perverse sheaves, or at least have heard of those things, it's what happens when you drop this uh, constraint of having regular singularities. So just uh, for a general kind of 
layout of what I'm going to talk about, I would want to just briefly recap what this new correspondence is, um, maybe why you might care about it. Um, and the problem I want to look at is what does it mean to have a vanishing cycle in this context? Um, so anyone who knows me or, you know, those who have been doing like Terry or Tony for the past, you know, however many years is that uh, I'm really interested in applying perverse sheaves to studying singularities of like hypersurfaces um, or just complex analytic spaces in general with non-isolated singularities. So, um, and I guess one question is, why does this fit in to a talk about metric geometry? Um, well, this new language of in sheaves or enhanced in sheaves is sort of kind of more powerful than the classical language of like constructible sheaves, which really are better suited to studying the topology of a space and don't really see the more fine grained metric information about a space. But I remember a talk I saw by Kashiwara a few years ago where he just said, you know, there's no sheaf of bounded functions, but there is an end sheaf of bounded functions. You can see this more fine grained thing and very loosely, I'm not going to go into details about what enhanced in sheaves really are, but you should keep in mind like the analogy in the back of your head of sheaves are to functions as in sheaves are to distributions. Very loosely, like it's this bigger category of objects that are somehow like limits of duals to sheaves with compact support. So my hope is, you know, one day when this theory is more fleshed out and not so fresh, you know, I'll see you in just a second here that the full correspondence was only proved like six years ago after, you know, about a hundred years of working on it. Um, that'll kind of bridge this gap between this language of constructible sheaves and uh, the metric geometry and metric topology of uh, these singularities. So the classical Riemann and Hilbert correspondence for you know, regular polynomial D modules was proved in full generality back in 1984 by uh, Kashiwara and uh, Medkut. I don't think they like to be said that they're done at the same time, but they were. Um, this is a generalization of something that came out of, um, say, like Hilbert's 21st problem. Which is just this kind of categorical equivalence between perverse sheaves and regular holonomic D modules. And this extends to this, you know, derived level between the derived category of uh, D modules with regular holonomic cohomologies and the derived category of C modules with C constructible cohomologies. So you kind of keep in the back of your head, like this is all just kind of almost like a philosophical question of what does it mean to be the solution of some like linear PDE with regular singularities. And it took another, you know, 30, 40 years or so to really nail down what happens if you drop this constraint of having regular singularities? What does it mean to be the solution even to like, you know, a linear ODE on the complex plane uh, with irregular singularities? And so this was, I guess, first solved maybe in, I think 1980 actually, uh, in just the complex plane, the local analytic case in C um, by, you know, Deline, Malgrand, Jusufui, and a couple people. Um, but the full generality in the case of just arbitrary regular, or arbitrary holonomic D modules uh, on a complex manifold took another you know, uh, 40 years or so, 35 years. And so that, that main result is just an equivalence of these drive categories um, of complexes of enhanced in sheaves whose heart, you know, if you take the image of the heart of uh, polynomial D modules, you get these things called uh, enhanced in perverse sheaves, which is kind of a mouthful. So I'll usually just call these irregular perverse sheaves. So part of this, we'll just kind of talk about um, 
what the intuition for those things should be in the simplest possible case of just, you know, the local analytics situation in uh, dimension one, where everything is most understood. There's like the most history in that case. There's several different ways of describing these things. Um, and what vanishing cycles might look like in that case. So again, a little bit more context is if you, there's a natural sort of inclusion of regular holonomic modules, D modules into holonomic D modules. And this has a left adjoint called regularization. And very loosely in general, what you should think about is a perverse sheaf and an irregular perverse sheaf. These two categories have this similar adjunction. This is just kind of a way of embedding perverse sheaves into enhanced perverse sheaves or irregular perverse sheaves. And there's a left adjoint called sheafification or underlying sheaf. So very loosely in general, we'll see this a little bit later on, is that an irregular perverse sheaf is sort of like a perverse sheaf plus a filtration on lower dimensional strata. As you descend into the singularities, you have this kind of filtration on how you approach the singularity. And this is where we start seeing this metric behavior. And these adjoints are both um, exact functors as well. So it really helps us kind of move back and forth between the two pictures where we understand perverse sheaves quite well in a lot of these situations where we'll see irregular perverse sheaves. So we, this is kind of like a sanity check. You know, if you have something unreasonable or uh, for irregular perverse sheaves, you can always take the sheafification and kind of descend down to this easier level. Look at things. Again, this is just like a little picture of what this correspondence actually looks like when you're kind of doing computations. Um, this Duram functor that takes some D module and spits out a perverse sheaf or some complex of sheaves is really just looking at you know, the Duram complex of that D module. So let's say in dimension one, your cohomology sheaf in degree minus one is just this um, sheaf of flat sections of this D module, or you, when you write it as say, it's a differential equation, it's this complex of solutions. And here's just two examples of you know, a D module with regular singularity versus one with irregular singularity. And if you're kind of playing around with these, the main kind of weirdness that happens is, well, for this equation with a regular singularity, its solutions look like, say, one over Z. Or in general, it looks like maybe Z to the alpha for some complex number alpha. Some general, some multivalued function, but it's not too exotic. Right? You have some monodromy as you travel around the origin um, due to the multivalued nature of the solution, uh, but it's very reasonable. The difficulty in the irregular situation is that suddenly you get these solutions that look like maybe e to the one over Z. And when you try doing the same kind of naive construction of, well, let's just plug a D module with irregular singularities into the drum complex and see what happens is that you no longer get this, you know, one-to-one -one kind of construction between a D module and its solutions. Uh, there is usually too many solutions with the same monodromy. For example, uh, we'll see in a bit that you, know, you plug in any kind of D module of the form Say it's an, an OX star module. So these are just meromorphic functions with pole at zero. Um, maybe connection like D minus DF. We'll spit out a, its flat sections will be functions of the form E to the F. Usually F is some Puiseaux series or uh, meromorphic function. But this has trivial monodromy as you travel around the origin. And so it's the REM complex at least you know, oops. in degree minus one is always just gonna be the constant sheaf on C star. Oops. So this is one of the main issues that you kind of can't distinguish these different objects that have kind of vastly different qualitative behaviors you travel around the origin.
So that's kind of the general setting. And the problem at hand that I'm actually caring about um, is you know, well, we have this whole new language of um, you know, enhanced in sheaves and perverse sheaves and with regular singularities. And what I care about in this whole thing is um, trying to apply it to studying singularities of spaces. So one of the main ways of doing that, um, if you use this language, is the vanishing cycles, the perverse use of nearby and vanishing cycles. Uh, so I have this kind of blurb that, you know, even if you don't really care about any of the stuff I just talked about at all, if you've ever worked with singularities, you've probably seen stuff about millionaire fibers and computing their cohomologies. Um, for, you know, hypersurface singularities, computing the cohomology of a millionaire fiber is one of the biggest problems in general. Finding ways to, you know, algorithms or different uh, methods of computing these cohomology groups. And one of the reasons you might care about this is that, well, the vanishing cycles complex or, you know, even as a functor computes this cohomology. And some other stuff in general. So these things give perverse exact functors from any you know, complex manifold. This one is actually be some complex manifold and f is some function on it. Or even just any kind of a complex analytic space. And this is uh, C constructible cohomologies. So it's this useful, like powerful functorial language um, have being perverse exact functors. And another part of the picture is kind of how the nearby and vanishing cycles fit together. There's these two canonical, uh, or I should say natural distinguished triangles. Uh, the canonical map and the variation map. that when you plug in F is the constant sheaf, spit out the usual canonical and variation morphisms on the cohomology of the known fiber that you're maybe more familiar with. And one last thing is maybe, uh, well, if you're interested in the language of mixed Hodge modules uh, or this kind of interaction between, you know, Hodge theory and singularities, you can't really study them at the level of mixed Hodge modules without the language of nearby and vanishing cycles. These are kind of the way of cutting down the dimension of the support of a, D module um, and kind of retaining that perversity in those nice conditions. So the central question is, is there, you know, a generalization of this to this new enhanced setting? And kind of surprisingly, well, like maybe not surprisingly that it's so new. Um, yes, but it's only known in detail in dimension one in the local analytic case in dimension one. And that was only proved like last March or something um, in 2020. So it's still a very fresh uh, problem. And specifically, you want this kind of diagram where in general, you have some complex manifold or just complex analytic space. Um, and this diagram of you know, functors where there's some kind of suitable enhancement of the vanishing cycles. Usually I'll just write like, a, a, like an E in front of whatever functor I'm enhancing to extend the situation that makes this whole diagram commute. Again, this is sort of the natural embedding into the enhanced setting. And this is the associated sheaf functor. So before I kind of get into what my actual method was, um, I just want to recall some basics in dimension one, uh, what a perverse sheaf even looks like. Before I can even talk about completing this picture, working with perverse sheaves or anything, um, we should kind of be aware of what they look like, what the differences are when they enhance setting. So let's say if I have some perverse sheaf uh, on an open neighborhood of the uh, origin in C, the simplest possible case, and we say it has one singularity at, at just the origin. Well, then it's quite easy to describe. It's just some complex with cohomologies only in degree minus one and zero, uh, where in degree minus one, generically, it's just a local system in that degree. And at the origin, we have this these strong vanishing conditions. These are the support and co-support conditions.
which basically says, you know, generically, it's just a complex in degree minus one. It's a local system. And at the origin, it's only allowed to have cohomologies in degree zero or minus one. When we extend to the irregular perverse chief case, it's not super different at first, yeah, face value. You have these kind of enhancements of the same restriction. Generically, it is just a local, uh, a local system in degree minus one. Um, the main new thing is this constraint on this local system has something called normal form at the origin. This is what the idea I had before, or uh, sorry, uh, I was saying before, where here, sorry. this is that idea of the filtration thing. This is kind of a, like this metric structure as I travel around the origin, different ways of approaching the singularity. And this comes from what the local structure of solutions to holonomic demog, or I should, I should say flat sections, maybe. Of holonomic demogs. So if you've ever seen this kind of case um, for, holon for regular holonomic demogs, you know that they locally just look like z to some power, some complex power times some convergent holomorphic function. You have some just some coefficients that appear if you have some kind of repeated um, value lambda here, um, but they're you know very reasonable things. These are are meromorphic functions of moderate growth around the origin. The difference in the irregular case is that we get these contributions from these exponential d modules. So. The main structure theorem is that you can say that formally, asymptotically, there's this isomorphism of any holonomic D module, or you can think that as some like OX module, OX star module uh, with meromorphic connection into this finite direct sum of some exponential D module tensor with a regular part. But the issue is that this is just kind of a formal thing. Um, it's an asymptotic formula. It does lift to an actual isomorphism, but it lifts locally, not on the base space, which is just the neighborhood of the origin, but to something called the, the real oriented blow up, which is really just a fancy way of saying the space of polar coordinates. So it's, it's sort of local in the space of directions at that point. So what this is, is just, you know, it's a smooth manifold of boundary. Usually it's to note this uh, projection by pi. This is kind of like the slash bar pi. It's just isomorphic to, uh, Positive real, sorry, non negative real numbers cross S1. So I'll kind of need this diagram of spaces uh, frequently in the, in the future. So we just have this inclusion of the origin. This is uh, X minus the origin. And this is my real blow up. And it's important that this is nice morphism away from zero. And S1 is my exceptional divisor. So what I make a definition now of so what I meant by locally before. So this is sort of locally in the real blow up. So pick some angle theta, um, and I'll talk about a sectorial neighborhood or an angular neighborhood of theta. So I, I picture, you know, theta is this you know, direction. Then an angular neighborhood is just what you think. It's just some like uh, neighborhood that kind of contains that in the limit in some sense. So 
it's going to be some open neighborhood of x minus the origin, uh, such that if I extend it into the blow up via this map j right here, then j union the exceptional divisor is just an actual neighborhood of theta in the real blow up space. So I kind of picture that right here. It turns this you know, angular neighborhood into a rectangular neighborhood. But of course, if you have neighborhoods that are kind of too pinched, if you have a cone that's like kind of maybe like an exponentially tangent at that point, um, then this doesn't actually become a neighborhood in that world. So you really want to picture these sectorial neighborhoods as just like a rectangular neighborhood of theta in the blow up space. So this is this is not a neighborhood. And I usually will denote this by a you know theta inclusion into u with a, a dot over the head. And so this normal form that I mentioned before is sort of has this, you know, I, I've seen it referenced before in, with this like absurdly silly long name. Um, I'm gonna entirely pass the blame off on that to this, uh, to Kuagaki in his, uh, I think 2019 paper, Irregular Perverse Sheaves. Just for the naming convention, because uh, so, this this is sort of a structured theorem that's based off you know, thirty five years of work from different people. Uh, so it's the, it's Danilo Kashiwara's version of Saba Mochizuki Kedlaya's version of the Hukuhara level Turretin theorem, um, which is a mouthful. But the idea is really just that for, uh, you can lift that local isomorphism, or sorry, that formal isomorphism for every theta into an isomorphism of the following form. So I've got some, say, irregular perverse sheep here. And then if I restrict it to you, that, that sectorial neighborhood, then it's gonna be a direct sum of these exponential D modules. Or I should say, exponential solution complexes. So there's some stuff I'm kind of sleeping under the rug and by not going into all the details with uh, enhanced in sheaves. Um, one of them is, you know, restriction in this case is really just uh, a sort of tensor is the, kind of the better way of doing it. Where in this case, I is this map. We keep this extra uh, coordinate on there that kind of keep track of the growth factors of our solutions. And these are the things that sort of um, correspond to these exponential D modules that I mentioned in the previous slide. So the moral being that really, if you want to understand these irregular perverse sheaves, it kind of suffices locally to understand what these um, so-called exponential enhanced in sheaves look like. The things that kind of come from uh, these exponential D modules. So as I was saying before, um, if you take you know, the enhanced theorem complex of this this guy, this exponential D module, what comes out is this object right here, um, which is sort of a limit in this in category. I'm not going to go into details really with all these extra kind of fancy gadgets like hanging around here, but really you should think about this thing. Part of the reason that this takes so much time to really do precisely is that it's a limit in some sense of uh, the real part of this, um, I should say, ah, that's super important. Um, kind of whenever this makes sense as exclusion with moderate growth.
So there's these parentheses around, or sorry, quotes around the limit that sort of takes place as a limit in the in category instead of a, you know, an ordinary limit of sheaves. And these objects are really kind of sheaves on our neighborhood X cross the real line. So we kind of add on an extra point at infinity to capture the sort of square. So this is like a fairly technical kind of category, but I want to actually describe these things. Uh, what I'm going to approach it in this is more like down to earth category of Stokes filtered local systems, which are much more reasonable. They're just, you start with some local system on the exceptional divisor of this real blow up, which is just S1. And you sort of filter it by uh, meromorphic functions, or more generally by these Pusso series. So in this case, this kind of complicated looking thing is really just, you should think about it as some local system of finite rank on S1, where we have this filtration that kind of varies along the points of the circle. In the following way. So this looks like this is the kind of filtration. Waiting a little bit. So just in general, this thing is just a copy of C. And there's this level of the filtration, which just kind of spits out wherever this thing has moderate growth. This is sort of supported on all those data such that F has moderate growth at theta. And it's a filtration in the sense that um, out of room that let's say if I have two functions say G and H such that uh, the real part of G minus H is bounded above as Z approaches this angle theta in the real blow up. Then there's a natural inclusion from the filtration at level G to the filtration at level H. And what this does is kind of lets you recover this exponential factor um, up to an element of, um, up to a bounded homomorphic function. So if you're actually kind of doing these computations out, this is sort of what it looks like for two simple cases of where F is one over Z and where F is one over Z squared. So the filtration at level zero for one over Z is just gonna be um, the picture sort of the real blow up or the exceptional device of the real blow up that's right here. And so the things I have kind of highlighted in all these other colors are different levels of where the real part of one over Z is greater than some uh, real number. So the parts where this is, found, oops, Found it below by zero or above by zero. These parts here. And as you look at different parts of this filtration, say you kind of creep more into the this bad area. Right, so that's just kind of context, really. So what do vanishing cycles mean in this context? Well, in the case of, you know, local in the case in uh, dimension zero, they're very, very simple, right? You know, you can choose any local coordinate Z uh, at zero, and then you have this uh, diagrams, the nearby vanishing cycles at zero. You have this, um, these are kind of just vector spaces 
uh, in a single degree with a canonical and variation morphism. Right here. But the main idea is that in this really simple case, since the hypersurface it defines, which is just zero, uh, is smooth, you can identify these things with the complexes of specialization and microlocalization in uh, Sato, which you normally can't do if you have a non singular, or if you have a um, singular hypersurface. Sorry. So this is really something you can only do um, when the hypersurface is smooth. And so really, if you care about singularities and applying advanced cyclists to them, this only works in dimension one. So I'm gonna kind of skim over the details on what these actually, how they're actually defined. Um, but really loosely is that, you know, if you are working on this blow up, so here's, imagine you got the origin, here's the blow up, which I'll just picture as some rectangular strip where I identify the sides and here's the fiber over zero, which is my S1, it kind of, Here's some neighborhood of theta. We kind of we restrict away from zero, identify it with the parts with coordinate, uh, you know, uh, R greater than zero, which is over here. And then restrict down to the side surface. So it just kind of pulls out the tangential behavior of the complex near Theta. This is my uh, specialization functor. So part of what I was really interested in is that in all of their work, and you know, they had maybe the splits of papers um, last year and the year before, um, Daniel and Kashwara. Um, much work is done with the nearby cycles because it's much more uh, intuitive to compute. Uh, I'll go into what the details are in the next slide, but um, virtually no work is done at all on what the vanishing cycles are. Uh, they're defined to be just the Fourier Sato transform of this specialization complex. <laughs> and so I, I kind of make a note here that this was not intuitive at all. Uh, there's, there's no computations given, no examples given, um, no general framework given. So part of this project kind of arose out of a frustration for me that uh, I didn't understand it at all. And I tried to reach out to Kashiwara and Dunno, um, and they didn't respond. So I, I made my own framework of how to actually compute them. So again, I'm not gonna go into details of how you actually kind of calculate these things, um, at least in this setting. But the idea is really very loosely, um, you take the same construction that defines the specialization and microlocalization functors and kind of interleave this associated chief functor and enhanced versions of the other functors involved. And it spits out things that are analogous to, or rather do give an equivalence um, with this kind of local system that's filtered pictured. This is again, it's the context that these do kind of correspond to the things that you should want in general, which is if you take in some irregular perverse sheave and apply these objects to it, this enhanced nearby invention cycle functor, um, you get something that is again, um, in the image of some like perverse sheaf from downstairs. And it's concentrated in degree zero. Again, like we should expect, given the classical case, this, this kind of quiver picture. That when you take the, you know, the vanishing and nearby cycles of some perverse sheaf on the disk, then you just get some complex in degree zero concentrated at a single point. But this was the main result. There was there is no kind of talk at all 
about actually computing them. One simplest example, uh, there's no, mo I kind of mentioned uh, the canonical morphisms or the vanishing morphisms, or the, sorry, the variation morphisms. And in higher dimensions, it's kind of a wide open. And it's very much unknown what those look like in these higher dimensions, at least in this framework. I should say that if you kind of kind of continue on in the Stokes picture, Stokes picture, you can This is kind of known in general for um, in higher dimensions, but no actual like computations can really be done in any case that isn't just some divisor with simple normal crossing singularities. Um, it's extremely hard to calculate this in general. Or rather, I should say that the nearby cycles are known in higher dimensions, but not the vanishing cycles are still not known at all. So here's a simple kind of calculation of what the nearby cycles will look like for the simplest possible case of uh, one exponential in sheet that's defined um, on a whole punctured disk. Um, the underlying local system is just C in degree zero. The filtration at level G is just, again, all those data for which um, the real part of F minus G is bounded above that data. And the graded part in level G, this is all this data for which F minus G is actually just bounded at uh, angle theta. Yeah, I do. I do apologize for the fairly like, disjointed um, setting of this uh, problem and talk in general. Is that uh, this being such like a fairly new field? It's there's still several different factions kind of going outward in their own you know uh, directions. Uh, without kind of, there's no general dictionary of traveling between the different kind of frameworks. I think I have like five more minutes, 10 more minutes, something like that. I'm not really sure. Uh, five. Five minutes. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So that gets actually, you know, the things that I did. Um, so the key framework here is that these things, you should think about them really as a local system where the, the filtration that varies by the angle around theta, around the circle. And so there is a version of nearby like nearby vanishing cycles that does exactly that. Uh, nearby vanishing cycles at fixed angle. Um, I learned these from Dave Massey. I think it's might be due to him, but I haven't really seen it in any other context. So the idea is instead of looking at you know nearby vanishing cycles as kind of pulling back and pushing forward to this universal fiber, um, you just choose a section and work with the nearby vanishing cycles within a specific direction. So if you look at maybe like the ray at angle theta, you do the exact same pullback and push forward framework you would normally, but just to this angle. And this kind of, you know, might send to the slightly more familiar framework of, um, you can regard the vanishing cycles as sort of sections with support um, in the positive direction of the real part of F and the nearby cycles as sections with support in the open uh, negative part of the real part of F. But this actually ends up giving like the wrong intuition. Um, you kind of want to re reverse this and flip it by, by pi radians. So if you want to think about, oops, The, um, if you want to think about nearby cycles as sort of at direction theta as the things that live in the direction of theta, then you should actually kind of rotate this by five degrees, pi radians. So here's the things that I actually did was this, um, in this framework, um, you do get natural isomorphisms for all theta of 
the nearby cycles at angle theta is naturally isomorphic to the stock of the specialization at angle theta. Um, the various cycles at angle theta is naturally isomorphic to the stock of the micro microlocalization at, at angle theta plus pi. You have to do this kind of in typical map to get the right idea. Because a priori, these things live on sort of different spaces. This lives on the unit sphere bundle, the five of the unit sphere bundle over zero, and this lives in the dual sphere bundle. So theta kind of corresponds to different things for these objects. And in this framework, the important thing is that you actually can describe the canonical morphism and the variation morphism quite easily. And it's compatible with these partial monodromy operators which is rotating by theta degrees. Or theta radius, I should say. So the idea is that once you restrict this fixed angle or any fixed angle, you can define these objects that are much simpler and much easier to actually compute examples. Um, and you just let this angle vary and you get these kind of simpler to describe objects. And the nice thing is this also holds in any dimension. Uh, functorially. You can define the nearby and vanishing sites as a fixed angle for any function in any dimension. Um, but then related to the case in dimension zero, or sorry, dimension one, um, by this sort of base change formula. So by setting up this framework and then using the ideas of Danilo and Kashiwara from last year, you can then kind of bootstrap to any dimension. So this is still kind of ongoing work on making sure that this is all actually doable with examples in higher dimensions, uh, but the framework is there. And then, yeah. You know, the simple example is you can take this, this is where your, your toy example is just a, any half line, which you think about as a ray at angle theta, uh, but then you can just work entirely in terms of this line. And then you obviously kind of leave with this sort of framework is that you can define nearby invention cycles in this context of this like just a half line where you think about some asymptotic behavior coming towards zero. And you can define a filtration of these things with just any continuous function defined on the uh, the, the um, non-zero part of this. So Brad, I yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I can stop soon. Um, but yeah, yeah. So the, the general idea is just, is this. This is kind of the, the powerful tool that actually lets you do all the computations. You can reduce this complicated thing on the real blow up, um, these enhanced inches and everything to just as simple as possible case of a half line, um, and do filtrations in that context as well. Um, and it's actually kind of it fits in with sort of this language of moderately discontinuous homology that um, I know uh, Javier was doing. Um, that I was actually kind of very interested in le learning last year, but I never got a chance. Um, but you, you can actually do computations. And here's the last thing is that just what a basic cycle corresponds to is detecting when some function is not bounded above by, by the level sets. Yeah. This is the, just kind of the simplest possible case. Um, in dimension one, kind of fully worked out, and then it does generalize geometry questions. But yeah, thank you. If anyone has any questions, I can you know keep going later in a private chat or something. I don't want to keep you. Oh, uh, we sent the speaker. Are there any questions for Brian? No. So uh, it's thanks, Brian, again. This is four out of uh, you know working next to Terry and uh, Tony for several years and listening to talks by you know Walter and 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 then not understanding Lipschitz geometry from this perspective. So I, I was trying to you know hop, hop into it. 
Hope to see you soon, Brian. Yeah, you too.